the consortium of the co-funded Pathbox project, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our first knowledge sharing event, anti-slap legal training experiences from the Pathbox project. Strategic litigation against public participation represent a growing threat to freedom of expression across Europe. The use of legal action to silence journalists, human rights defenders, and other public watchdogs, and deter others from following their lead, has exploded over the past five years. The data suggests that the use of legal threats to silence speech, hamper investigative reporting, and restrict assembly in Europe is growing exponentially with direct consequences for public access to information and, as a result, to democratic and corporate accountability across the EU. There is now broad acknowledgement of this problem. Last year, the European Court of Human Rights recognized the risk this kind of proceedings have for the quality of our democracies. Slaps undermine democratic rights and have serious implications on the EU legal order. Anti-slap initiatives like Pathbox are urgently needed and there is certainly a lot to be done on a range of different fronts. Last year, the European Commission took a major step forward in tackling the problem by approving a comprehensive package of measures, the proposed directive and the recommendation. While the proposed directive pro seeks to introduce legally binding safeguards to address SLAP with, with cross-border elements, the recommendation not only encourages member states to implement these safeguards, proposed in the directive also for domestic SLAP cases. The recommendation advocates specifically for SLAP-related training for lawyers, officers of the court, and other justice professionals, and as well for raising awareness activities. Anyone who has spoken to an individual or group targeted with a SLAP lawsuit knows that the quality of legal advice available is crucial, and Pathfox was set up specifically to respond to this need to improve the quality of frontline legal defense against SLAP and make the prospect of this kind of litigation less overwhelming. One year ago, 11 organizations came together from across the European Union and joined forces in an effort to make legal empowerment a crucial part of the transformation that is needed to address SLAP. Pathfox is working across 11 member states. Bulgaria, Croatia, Cyprus, Germany, Hungary, Malta, Poland, Romania, Slovakia, Slovenia, and Spain. Operating across 11 EU member states and in some of the European countries with worse slap problems, our consortium has been working to keep European legal professionals with the tools to defend their clients against abusive litigation intended to silence them and to shield the speech of others. Now we have reached the halfway part of our project and we can offer our initial report. During this first year, Pathfox Partner Organization conducted a holistic in-depth investigation on the phenomenon of SLAP in their countries, carried out local research and assessed the learning needs of local lawyers. The results of this initial scoping exercise contributed to the development of the Pathfox anti-SLAP curriculum, the first of its kind, which combines European human rights law and principle, international legal principle with deep local knowledge of procedure and case law, now available both in English and local languages on our project website. What you will find on the website is what we have been using in our first round of training successfully conducted across all 11 member states from November 2022 to February 2023, as well as some videos taken from those workshops. If there is one key lesson to take away at this point is that there is a significant untapped demand for the training we are offering. At the halfway mark of the project, Pathfox has already reached the 200 lawyers we were aiming for, and the second round of training workshop will be held through this year. Despite the challenges faced along the way, which we'll be discussing during the panel sessions today, our workshop and materials have been remarkably well welcomed in each country. Also, organizations from other countries outside our consortium have shown great interest in Pathfox activities. Today, we decided to invite all of you here to share initial insights from the first local workshop and engage in a discussion on anti-slap initiatives. 
During the first roundtable, our project European legal expert, Professor Justin Borbate, who are through some of our core curriculum materials, will discuss the general challenges and opportunities of taking actions against lab with Vanya Juric, attorney at law from Croatia, also a member of the European Commission expert group on lab and one of the PATFOX local legal trainers, and Bettina Berend of Safe of Save the Rainforest, who have just this week prevailed against an attempt to slap them. From there, we will move on to a series of interactive panels, during, bringing together those directly involved in training across the 11 project countries to discuss some of the most acute slap problems faced during the first year of the implementation of the project. I'm confident that these roundtables will offer all of us a very timely and useful contribution and plenty of material for reflection and use in the design and implementation of anti-slap initiatives at the national and regional levels. Before concluding, I would like to take this opportunity to sincerely thank the Chair of the European Parliament's Committee on Civil Liberty, Justice and Home Affairs, Mr. Juan Fernando López Aguilar, who is hosting the event, and the President of the European Parliament, Madame Roberta Metzola, who together with Mr. López Aguilar will deliver the closing remarks today. Also, I would like to convey my appreciation to the moderators and speakers for their time and support in contributing to this event. And finally, to conclude, on behalf of the PATH Consortium, I thank you all participants most warmly for your participation and wish you all a very enjoyable event. Now, I would like to pass the floor to my colleague, Naomi Colmin from Blueprint for Speech, who will moderate the roundtable on taking action against slap challenges and opportunities. Naomi, the floor is yours. My name is Naomi Colvin, and I work for Blue Sp Blueprint for Free Speech, who have been um, working with FIBRA on the coordination of the project and also organising training in Germany, of which um, you'll hear a bit more later today, I think. Um, so in this first roundtable, uh, we have the slightly difficult job of setting the agenda for the rest of the day in just 25 minutes. Luckily, it doesn't fall on entirely on me to do that because we have some really excellent panellists to uh, join in this discussion, um, one of whom I'm looking at at the moment. Um, so... We have on video Justin Borge-Barte, the convener of the Anti-SLAP Hub at the University of Aberdeen. Justin has authored many of the core curriculum materials, which we will now find on our curriculum hub on our website at antislap.eu. Um, we're also very happy to have Bettina Berend, who is a board member of Save the Rainforest, a German environmental NGO who have themselves found themselves the target of abusive litigation. And Vanya Juric, who is in the, who is in the room today, um, also with Justin, a member of the European Commission's um, expert group on SLAPT, an attorney working in Croatia. And we've been very privileged to have Vanya participate and um, actually conduct our trainings in Croatia. So turning to Justin first. Justin, you've been very involved in the ongoing advocacy at the EU level to secure legislation to combat the SLAP problem. Um, what are the key issues raised by SLAPs in your view? Well, obviously, there is the, the key issue is obviously freedom of expression. But um, with that, I think there is a need to recognise more broadly that what we're contending with here is misuse of the legal process to manipulate democratic processes. Essentially, then, um, we see powerful actors, whether economically or, or politically, or indeed often both, using the legal process to suppress our right to know things, to know things which are of interest to us in the manner in which we are governed. And um, there is, of course, a significant problem which largely is undetected and therefore for which there is a significant need for education, both among the general public, but also specifically among lawyers and the judiciary, as has of course been noted already. Um, and, and with that, 
what we need to acknowledge is that legal education does not, at this current stage, address fully the scale of the problem which we are facing. And in order to resolve this, what needs to be done is, of course, not only to um, address legal education in the traditional sense at universities, but of course, um, to to help the legal profession, people who have not had contact with with uh, formal legal education for a long time, to deal with uh, with slaps in practice, but also to understand that we are not here dealing with a simple balance of of rights in the usual way, but what we are dealing with is misuse of process to suppress the rights of another party. Um, I'm aware, though, that time is quite limited, so I won't ramble on for too long. Thank you. No, that's great. Thank you. And we'll come back to you in due course. Um, Vanya, um, quality, so the quantitative studies of SLAPs we have show that Croatia has one of the worst SLAP problems in Europe, particularly if you look at the number of SLAPs per capita and the frequency of SLAP suits. As a practicing lawyer in Croatia, what would you emphasize as being key issues? Well, um, uh, in Croatia, I'm representing one of the biggest possibly news portal in Croatia. Uh, many journalists, uh, many NGOs, including the Croatian Journalist uh, Association. Uh, and from my experience in Croatia over the last 15 years, I can, uh, uh, with very much uh, peace, uh, say that um, slaps are uh, a very serious and a very, very systematic uh, attack on freedom of expression uh, and on journalistic media freedoms. Um, uh, Croatia is a member state, as you said, that has one of the biggest uh, problems uh, between the other member states uh, with slap lawsuits, uh, and it really is a big problem in Croatia, uh, hence my experience uh, in that area. So I have seen uh, firsthand uh, what it does and how directly it can, it can harm uh, a person, not uh, only uh, personally, not only professionally, but uh, uh, um, in the deepest meaning of the word, uh, existentially. Mm -hmm. uh, so in Croatia, we have, um, as plaintiffs, um, politicians, uh, public officials, public bodies, even judges. My colleague Sanya is going to uh, tell something, something uh, more about uh, that topic. But possibly, uh, if I wanted to give an example to make it... Um, uh, as obvious as possible uh, to anyone, one of the har har harshest and most serious uh, slaps uh, in Croatia were uh, the proceedings brought against the president of the Croatian uh, Journalistic mm -hmm. Association, uh, Mr. Hrvo Ezovko, uh, who was an employee of Croatian radio television, so yeah. the public authority, who was first, uh, first his employment contract was uh, terminated, leaving him with no income whatsoever. And after that, the public authority uh, initiated several proceedings uh, against him, uh, partly in damages, uh, which amounted uh, to 30 thousand euros, which is a really big sum mm -hmm. uh, in Croatian context, and also criminal proceedings uh, for defamation. Uh, so uh, all of those proceedings lasted uh, for around four years or a bit more. Uh, all of those proceedings uh, ended in favor of Hrvoje Zovko, uh, but regardless of that fact, regardless of the ending, it has lasted for four or five years, uh, and I can honest to say that it was abuse uh, for sure uh, and it in one of its clearest uh, forms. Uh, second thing I think it's important to say is that uh, I think we already discussed it mm -hmm. uh, to some length uh, is that it, it doesn't only influence the targets or the victims uh, but it goes to a much more broad uh, circle of sure. uh, persons uh, basically the whole public, uh, and especially the people who have the persons who have actually uh, witnessed it. Uh, it causes um, a really wide range um, uh, self-censorship, uh, chilling effects, and strives to um, uh, stop public debate on really important questions. Uh, so as for uh, my hopings, my mm -hmm. hopes, 
Um, I'm hoping that the member states are becoming aware of this problem. It seems at this point that they are, but I'm hoping we're, we're going to, to get much further than where we are now. Uh, I'm hoping that we are going to realize that it isn't something that is affecting only journalists or only limited groups of people, because it affects um, the core uh, of the European Union, our democratic values, and everything basically uh, uh, that is really necessary for our uh, societies to grow. Uh, and I'm hoping that the member states, and I'm going to finish here, I know we don't have much time, um, mm -hmm. are going to put in all the necessary efforts to support the directive, uh, to apply uh, all of the principles and standards set out in the proposal, um, and to also apply all of those principles to purely domestic slap cases, which I'm really hopeful of, but we'll wait and see. We will, will indeed. And thank you so much for that, Vanya, and thank you for of course, raising um, what the experience of SLAPS is like from the target's point of view. And I think that provides a very suitable moment to speak to Bettina. So, um, hi, Bettina. Thank you for joining us. I should start by saying congratulations, because I understand that the abusive litigation that um, say the Rainforest Rescue has been facing for many years was actually resolved in the past week and the higher court in Hamburg has vindicated you on all counts and ordered that the Indonesian company that was suing you um, has to pay the majority of your costs. Of course, that's an excellent result, but at the same time, um, you and your organization have been under threat for three years. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the background to the case and also the effect it has had on you and your organization for the past three years. Yes, thank you. Um, I will start with the effects on our work. Um, at first, uh, we were really intimidated. Uh, lawsuits were not only something to endanger financial resources, they are very time consuming and a source of anxiety. And uh, this source of anxiety can go so far and it can influence so, your work so far that you start with a self-censorship. But uh, we, of course we had to think twice how and what to write, but we go, didn't go so far. Our source of anxiety more, was more directed towards our partners in Indonesia. Uh, when our partners in Indonesia realized that Corindo is powerful enough to sue us in a German court, they felt quite helpless at first. And uh, we um, support our partners, and it is important for us to keep them safe. Um, we uh, we were lucky to have the Packard Foundation, uh, which backed us financially during the uh, lawsuit. And uh, now we come to the case. We were also lucky that the plaintiff made mistakes. Uh, we were sued by Canatec, a wind energy company in the Con Corindo conglomerate. Uh, but our letter was uh, about Corindo's destruction, rainforest destruction in Papua. And therefore, the, uh, the court indicated that uh, Kenneth had, had no standing as a plaintiff. And now you may ask, uh, we were in such a good position uh, in, in the court, why did we agree uh, to a settlement agreement? And this is also something that it's not on one level. We did it uh, and somehow we did it as a responsibility towards our partners in Indonesia. Uh, because I will tell you how it could have been uh, or how it could have ended if we had continued or if we had to continue. Um, the worst case scenario would have been if the court had called for victims from uh, Papua to testify. 
that would not only have been extremely costly in uh, Papua, a massive military presence protects the interests of the corporations there. And this chilling effect of the military would have made it very difficult to get open testimonies. And this is, uh, now you can imagine easy uh, how badly things have, could have come to us if we had to continue this lawsuit. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bettina. That's really important to hear, particularly the risk that your slap presented for your colleagues who would have found themselves in a very vulnerable position in yeah. Indonesia. Um, Justin, hearing stories like Bettina's, and I think we'll hear a bit more later on about um, the frequency of these kind of suits in Germany, do you think the um, prevalence of slaps and the frequency with which activists and journalists are being slapped is fully appreciated by legislators or, you know, other other representatives you've come across work, you know, in this on on the when trying to persuade people about this issue. Thanks, Naomi. Well, um, certainly some legislators appreciate the, the full extent of slaps because um, it's not entirely unheard of for um, politicians to be plaintiffs in slap suits. But um, in terms of um, legislators seeking to combat slaps, I think what we have still at this stage is some pockets of, um, uh, of, of, of activism where we have a number of people who are seeking to overturn the orthodoxy in our understanding of how to balance rights as between plaintiffs and respondents. Um, so ultimately, the, the short answer to your question is no, I don't think we have sufficient awareness at this stage. Um, and indeed, that is to an extent reflected in a degree of reticence to extend the scope of the EU's proposed, of the European Commission's proposed directive, and indeed um, out with the European Union um, in the United Kingdom there, while there is some movement in England and Wales, for example, in Scotland, there remains um, resistance to the adoption of legislation. Now, I'm using the Scottish example because that's something we're working on at the moment, um, but it is a good example of a jurisdiction which has sought to, um, to, to safeguard freedom of expression through legislative interventions, but where legislators in the greater part do not fully appreciate the fact that simply changing defamation law is not enough, for two reasons, of course, because defamation law is not the only route to bring a slap case, but also because um, it isn't simply about the balance of, of right, substantive rights, but it is more importantly about procedure, about providing comfort to respondents in slap cases that they will um, not, during or after proceedings, be in a worse position than they were previously, and indeed that they would be able to um, have proceedings dismissed at an early stage without having to settle um, in a manner which is not actually uh, um, balanced, um, because of course what we have is a negotiation in which one party holds all the cards because they are um, ultimately wealthier. So um, short answer, no, I don't think there is sufficient um, awareness, but of course um, I don't think we need to be too pessimistic. The degree of awareness is far greater now than it was previously. And um, through initiatives such as this and, and other related initiatives, um, that, that awareness is increasing. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And I'll turn back to you, Vanya, for a final word, if I may. Um, so as we've suggested at a few points in this discussion, the draft directive that's under discussion at the moment and going through the processes in this place and others um, deals primarily with cross-border cases, whereas actually... A, this, and, you know, Bettina has been describing sort of an emblematic cross-border case, but then a lot of the cases that you deal with and all the other colleagues we'll hear from today on the ground are Croatian cases, which are launched by Croatian plaintiffs against Croatian defendants. 
um, what contribution do you think projects like Pat Fox play to helping with that side of things? And what else do you see that needs to be done? Uh, I'm actually, uh, when, when we talk about Pat Fox and this project and what you are, what all of us are doing, uh, I'm very happy that education and training have been uh, recognized as one of the uh, first and possibly most important steps uh, regarding the, uh, the directive, the proposal of the directive and its uh, application. Uh, yes, uh, I would bet that possibly 90% or, or 95% are purely domestic cases. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why it is really necessary for the member states uh, to consider applying all of those mechanisms from the directive in, into our national legal systems, applying also to domestic mm -hmm. cases. But education and training uh, is a topic I have been insisting on for a very long time. Also in Croatia, we are having panels and discussions uh, about it. I'm not sure uh, if I have been taken rather seriously, but I really do appreciate any outside help uh, you have been offering. Uh, so um, uh, freedom of expression uh, and media freedoms, I'm not sure whether general public understands it, but mm -hmm. it's a really complicated uh, legal area uh, where you need to know not only national regulations, but uh, international documents, uh, rulings of international courts, especially the European Court uh, of Human Justice, of Human Rights, I'm sorry. Um, uh, it, it takes knowledge. And uh, from creation experience, we have our national media laws, we have regulations regarding freedom of expression. We have been having them for decades, but we still in practice have very big problems with application of fundamental principles uh, of freedom of expression. So the reason for that uh, is lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and the only way we can battle SLAP um, uh, is by uh, educating practitioners how to apply not only the directive when it's in force, hopefully one day, but also the, the main principles uh, of freedom of expression. Uh, just to give you a short example, and you'll see what I'm talking about, uh, the proposal of the directive uh, defines slight lawsuits as manifestly or mostly un unfounded. It's one of the first steps, in, and it's going to be a first step in any case we mm -hmm. get. So for a person to be able uh, uh, to differentiate, to, to distinguish whether uh, a lawsuit is manifestly unfounded, uh, they will have to know all of the main principles and standards um, of freedom of expression, uh, all of the national regulations, but also uh, rulings of the European Court of Human Rights over the last 50 years. So uh, no one, with, without that knowledge, it's not going to be able to do it. Um, so to sum up, uh, trainings um, 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 are extremely important. And I would even dare to say that education and training are a precondition for application of all of the mechanisms uh, from the anti slap directive. Brilliant. I think that rounds it up yeah. really nicely. And all of these themes, I'm sure, will be coming up throughout the rest of the morning. So I'd like to thank our three panelists for setting the agenda so nicely. And I will turn back to Alessia, wherever she is, to continue the rest of the agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Naomi and Justin, Vanya and Bettina for this first round table. Now I would like to invite here for the first step, introduce, introducing the issues of SLAP, our first uh, panel session, uh, Jana Peloska from Bulgaria. From Cyprus, we have Professor Maria Cambria Kapadis and Teodoros Ekonomou. And Anushka Pavlis from Slovenia. And uh, also uh, from Slovakia, Ivan, who is going to moderate this session, and Tomas. Super. Uh, so it's a, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here, obviously. Thank you very much once again, Alessia, for taking this uh, uh, panel together and for all of us taking together finally to meet each other. 
each other and uh, to speak maybe on more practical issues uh, concerning not only the project but also of uh, concrete issues in specific countries. Uh, I'm, uh, as Alice already introduced, I'm uh, Ivan Godarski coming from Slovakia from MO98 NGO. Uh, we are based in Bratislava, we are dealing with uh, media monitoring, that was our prime task, but uh, since uh, our <clears throat> name indicates we have been established in 98, so basically 25 years almost uh, ago. And since then, uh, we moved from area of media monitoring to different areas, disinformation, technical assistance, to media regulatory bodies, to Central Election Commission. Uh, we are doing uh, quite a significant uh, load of work concerning elections, election integrity, uh, taking part in election observation mission. Currently, my colleague is in Nigeria in a EU election observation mission. And uh, obviously, the media freedom and the legal framework in which the journalists are, are working is one of the essential uh, areas. Uh, so if the, if the field can be improved and, and, and uh, conditions of all those uh, involved uh, can, be, uh, can be moved to another level, that's exactly what we are very much interested in. So it's my really pleasure to host this panel. I don't want to speak too much. I'll pass floor to each of uh, the panelists, uh, but then maybe if there will be space, uh, I might have some questions to, to add. So maybe without further ado, let's pass the floor to Jana. Uh, and she can tell us what are the issues of uh, SLAP, because this panel is called Introducing SLAP to, to, to some countries, as this is a, re a relatively new phenomenon. So maybe what are the issues in Bulgaria in this sense? Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. My name is Jana Peuska. I'm the Managing Director of the Media Development Center in Bulgaria. Um, introducing SLAP. It's, it's a big thing and a big issue everywhere around Europe uh, nowadays. Uh, but as am I supposed to, to speak firstly for Bulgaria, I will uh, give you some background information. Firstly, um, our country um, unfortunately has a very bad reputation as a media freedom wasteland. This was a, a definition uh, invented by the foreign correspondent, a very good one and a very sad one, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so the, the journalist and the media freedom very often is repressed by uh, gray areas, by uh, political figures, public figures, businesses, uh, etc. Uh, the mo um, even though the, the ranking of Bulgaria uh, regarding the media freedom has improved a lot uh, in the past uh, year, um, still we have plenty of uh, cases that now can be uh, freely called slap cases. Uh, just a very brief example for some recent cases in the last months. One of them um, of an uh, investigative uh, online media that was sued from um, uh, investment holding for half a million euros and uh, a journal issued by a former judge for 34,000 uh, euros. I mean, plenty of cases. Um, they were not uh, very well defined so far as uh, slap cases. Now the whole process is starting in Bulgaria. And obviously, uh, being a journalist and working as a journalist in our country is still not an easy job. Um, so, Talking about introduction of SLAP, we can say that in Bulgaria, uh, this starts now. Uh, it was just a few weeks ago when um, the character government of justice, Mr. Zarkov, announced, unfortunately, we have a character government. We are in a very bad series of uh, four or five elections for the last two years, which makes the things unstable and also makes... Uh, I suppose we have difficulties with implementation of the directive because it's a matter of political will and working groups and, you know, the whole system should be working properly. So we have another election in at the beginning of April. Let's hope that they will continue, uh, the next government will continue the, the support of the current caretaker, uh, uh, Minister of Justice, uh, who announced that the Bulgaria... Uh, the Bulgarian state supports totally the, the initiative, that measures uh, should be taken, that working groups will be set out uh, working on that, that uh, debate is needed uh, involving journalists, human rights defenders, and uh, legal experts, which means that there is a um, clear political view, but as I said, it's a, you know, temporary, it's not a temporary uh, 
government. Um, what we found out during the, the first uh, trainings we, we had in uh, Sofia and um, the first insight, so to say, is that first of all, uh, the lawyers need a clear, uh, a clear definition and uh, this kind of cases should be distinguished very cre uh, clearly. Because so far, the, the legal experts are referring to uh, the European Court for Human Rights, uh, practices of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, the freedom of expression, uh, expression the rights of uh, um, expression, but uh, they don't have their tools and really, how to say, uh, domestic practices, practices of domestic courts that they can refer to. So it's a big practical problem for them. Um, and they will need uh, more knowledge and more information on how to, to practice this, uh, referring to some court cases and uh, regulations. So what is needed is first of all to a kind of analysis in Bulgaria because we still don't have even a statistic on the slab cases. Uh, there is unofficial information gathered by the non-governmental organizations that the slab cases are more than 300, but still it's not official. So we need a clear analysis on the, the cases. We need uh, uh, criteria to, to define them. Uh, and then we need measures to be taken uh, in the local legislation and uh, clearly a debate on that involving uh, stakeholders like uh, political, the political figures, the journalists, the human rights defenders, the legal experts. Very good. Thank you very much. Those are quite some issues on the plate. Let's see whether there will be time to, to discuss them further. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Jana. Uh, let me pass floor to Maria and Theodoros from Cyprus. Hello. Uh, my name is Maria Kapadis. I'm from Cyprus University of Technology one of the partners of the project. And with me is um, the legal trainer, Mr. Theodoros Ikonomou, who um, is an attorney in Cyprus. I will briefly discuss with you the, the state of practice or what we found out from the case studies. Um, there are no published court cases in Cyprus regarding SLAP. The phenomenon of SLAP is largely unknown, um, even for legal professionals. Uh, we did um, find one particular case which is now um, pending in court re uh, relating to a journalist um, and undue pressure um, in order to silence uh, him in Cyprus. We carried out the first workshop in November um, in Nicosia where we had um, 20 lawyers attending. And in that particular session, um, Mr. Theodoros Ikonomou covered the anti-slab and the legal framework in Cyprus, the challenges and the opportunities, uh, which he will discuss with you shortly. We also had Professor Justin, um, whom you have heard from before, discussing the proposed directive. And um, given my background in forensic um, investigations, I covered um, how people can be helped um, and what they need to know in order to be avo to avoid being caught up in a slab case, um, looking at uh, fraud investigation, forensic accounting, um, and the floor is yours, um, Tadre. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this event for giving us the opportunity to share with you our experiences uh, on slab. Um, indeed, in Cyprus, um, there are no published court judgments, so we don't have a judgment saying that this is a slab case. Um, however, we are, are not uh, clear whether there are slab actions, but we are not aware of. So uh, it's a bit difficult to uh, understand uh, whether there are instances of slab in Cyprus generally. Uh, also, another thing I would like to say is that the court fees in Cyprus are quite low, so uh, there is no point in pursuing a court action to put pressure on a defendant uh, regarding costs. So you are not putting pressure 
on course. Um, it is important uh, during the during the uh, seminar. Um, the purpose of the seminar was to give a general idea to the participants as to what a slab is, because even for lawyers uh, dealing with defamation cases, uh, slab is something unknown. So we had to give them an introduction to what a slab means and then to discuss the directive and all these uh, very useful safeguards introduced by the directive. Um, an important part was to analyze the national mechanism for dealing with slab cases because um, the directive is not yet in force. So what lawyers have as a tool is the national mechanism. Um, we, for example, in Cyprus, you can strike out an action if it's frivolous and vexatious. But again, these mechanisms are not uh, always useful because um, there is case law that you can strike out an action only in exceptional circumstances. So it's not something that it's done as a matter of course, but it's something really exceptional. Um, so it's very, it's quite rare for courts to uh, dismiss actions at the preliminary stage. Of course, I need to say that uh, the case law of the Supreme Court of Cyprus, it's very pro-defendant. So they are, we are following the uh, jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. And recently, there are many defamation actions which are dismissed, not at the preliminary stage, but uh, at the hearing, at the final hearing of the, of the, of the action. Um, so... Uh, we have these safeguards. However, um, a defendant cannot stop a slab action or a defamation case from the preliminary stage. Uh, this is the disadvantage of the system. Um, so after we discuss the national uh, case law and the um, procedural safeguards, we went on to discuss the uh, directive and how the directive will enhance the protection of slab uh, victims. Um, of all the participants in the first seminar agreed that this directive will be an important step in the fight against slab, and they showed particular interest because uh, they understood that some things introduced which may be really helpful and uh, will add to the current safeguards that we have in the national law. Um, however, some participants raised concerns as to the implementation of this directive, whether this directive would be smoothly uh, implemented and transposed into the national law because it's not enough to just copy paste the directive. You need to um, explain in detail the provisions of the directive and the mechanism that these uh, tools will be used. Um, okay, so um, overall, uh, the, direct, the, the participants were um, quite satisfied with the uh, seminar. Uh, we had uh, questions as to the provisions of the directive. Uh, also, we had Justin who uh, explained in detail, and it was very helpful to, to explain the um, provisions of the directive. And we are planning, as Ms. Gabardis will say, we're planning to have another seminar and lectures uh, to introduce this directive, possibly to not only to lawyers, but to even broader uh, scope of people who are interested, maybe journalists and students. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, um, just to finish off. Um, it's been a, a very um, important learning exercise for us from the academic and from the legal um, professions in, in Cyprus to join forces and um, to try and transfer this knowledge uh, through this particular project. So it's, it's been a great experience to uh, educate and train both lawyers um, and, as Theodora said, the, this interest by journalists now 
and future um, <coughs> lawyers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria and Todoros. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, now I pass the floor to Anushka from Slovenia to tell us something more about Slovenia and reality. Thank you very much. <coughs> Uh, hello, my name is Anushka Podvršić, and I am a lawyer at the Legal Network for the Protection of Democracy. I will speak about SLEPS in Slovenia now. Um, legal Network consists of four NGOs, and one of them is open, so the Slovenian partner in this Petford project. At, uh, at, legal work, uh, at Legal Network now for two years, we are working with many lawyers to help people who find themselves in a legal process that are uh, unconstitutional. Uh, a lot of our work is about freedom of expression, and that is where we came across SLEPS. Um, <clears throat> SLEPS has been present in Slovenia uh, for many years now, but just recently people have started to understand them as SLEPS, and they start to understand that we need a different approach than uh, usually. Uh, for, for the PetFox project, we organize uh, training and uh, training for lawyers and a roundtable event, which was more public. Uh, the training consists of two lectures. One was by attorney Jasna Zakonšek, she is our trainer, and uh, other was by well-known uh, law professor uh, Alej Galic. We were very happy that many people, many lawyers, came to the training. We think because of the professor, but also because Legal Network has a wide reach now. Uh, on the round table, there were different speakers, a judge from Ljubljana High Court, a representative of Ministry of Justice. One of the um, speakers was also a victim of SLAP, a journalist from the website called, called Necenzurirano, Uncensored, um, a businessman uh, and a tax advisor of our former Prime Minister, uh, Janes Janša. Uh, his name is Rok Snežić. He filed more than 40, 45 private lawsuits against uh, this um, website. Um, during the event, we highlight some talks specific to the Slovenian context. Um, the preposition of the new anti slap directive is generally seen as very welcome, but however, it doesn't mean that the directive will change the issue of slap in uh, Slovenia. There is a big fear how the directive will be implemented into the Slovenian legislation. Um, in Slovenia, there is a lot of criminal procedures, but the directive refers only to civil proceedings. Professor Galic also mentioned the possibility that anti slap law will not only uh, be used by the good guys, but probably also the bad guys will use the anti slap law. So it's possible that this anti slap law will make the whole process even more expensive and more longer. Uh, okay. Thank you for your attention. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Anushka, for the moment. Uh, now I pass floor to Tomasz uh, Langer, who is an uh, attorney at law in, from Slovakia. Uh, he was the main uh, author of the curriculum for Slovakia, as well as the, uh, he was the main person who conducted the training, which we had in Bratislava in December. So I pass the uh, floor to him to present the situation in Slovakia. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Uh, the situation in Slovakia is uh, developing. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, I'm very glad uh, to be here. My name is uh, uh, Thomas Langer. I'm an attorney in Slovakia, and I've been representing media and NGOs for about 15 years, and mostly at the courts. Uh, it includes uh, major TV broadcasters in Slovakia, uh, the largest uh, publishers, NGOs, and radio broadcasters, and the largest uh, news uh, internet portals. Uh, at the beginning, of course, that 15 years already back, I had no idea about SLAPS, I had no idea about that abbreviation. 
Uh, but what I found out and learned uh, very soon uh, when I started uh, my work uh, for these clients is that many, many actions have similar characteristics, similar patterns. And it is that uh, the plaintiffs are wealthy, important, powerful people, and their targets are not only media, but also bloggers, local activists. It means people with very limited financial sources who are just bringing information about some information of uh, public interest. Uh, the situation in Slovakia, in my opinion, is uh, rather specific in that part that we have many plaintiffs which are judges or other people from judicial system, including prosecutors, even attorneys. And uh, we are facing this kind of people on the other part, as uh, defense lawyers. So, uh, for example, we have as a plaintiff, former minister of justice, former prime minister, we have chairman of uh, special criminal tribunal, chairman of Supreme Court. These are the plaintiffs which are suing uh, common journalists or their employers for 100,000 euro, 50,000 euro, which are, I would say, rather large uh, sums of money for Slovakia, where a couple of years back the average salary was 500 euro for your information. So when somebody is asking like 100 monthly salaries or 200 monthly salaries, this is uh, uh, really some which can financially ruin, ruin the defendant, the, the people. And what is now common among these uh, targets or victims is that they are using uh, crowdfunding to finance their defense in court proceeding. What, what, what is tragic that uh, in our country, member state of European Union, the people that can only lean just on the help of the judiciary, of the courts, but they have to uh, ask for help for common people, for the public, and raise the money for their defense and for the lawyers so they can stand and defend their rights at the courts. Um, from my experience, uh, slaps makes rather big part of the actions and lawsuits uh, against news. I personally represented maybe media in about two or 300 uh, cases. And I think at least 10 or 20% of the actions in my cases uh, can be considered to be slap actions. What is rather high number. For example, we had one article where the plaintiff, one very rich person uh, who was uh, using public funds and got, got some interesting contracts with the government. The article was about him and about his contract. He filed six uh, lawsuits, six for one article. Uh, we had uh, we have one f strong financial group who is just in some kind of fight with uh, some other media independent media in Slovakia, they filed 12 lawsuits within a few weeks for various articles about their undertakings. Mm -hmm. uh, what I identified in Slovakia is that, uh, of course, uh, our proposal of directive would be very helpful and uh, measures uh, introduced there uh, can help, but uh, this is not the main problem. The main problem in Slovakia, and I believe in many other countries, are, are not even as legal, legal practitioners, but are uh, the judges. They need some expertise, they need some uh, lectures for an education. That's my personal opinion. And really, I, I had the chance to see maybe 100 judges uh, dealing and deciding on these actions. And they are really lacking experience. They are lacking uh, understanding. The proceeding in Slovakia takes three, four, five years. I'm talking about first instance. So imagine this blogger, journalist, uh, whoever the defendant is, uh, just uh, paying his advocate for four or five years, always responding to some new uh, or broadened action and petitions from this uh, wealthy plaintiff. 
it's really time consuming. It's uh, financially devastating for those people and they are waiting five years. So what I already suggested, and it would be nice to hear your opinion, is that uh, national ministries of justice should introduce some uh, uh, educational programs, some lectures for the judges. We have justice, uh, academy for judges, for example. I already talked uh, with our minister about that, that they should explain the problematic to the judges so they can understand that speed up proceeding in these cases is really what is needed. And uh, they should uh, give a really quick, uh, quick response and quick uh, preliminary opinion on the merits on the case. They should uh, be really strict on the suggestions about uh, the evidence taking. For example, it's not normal that plaintiffs call 10 or 20 friends to talk about the consequences of the article and uh, the damage which was uh, caused to him and the judge let him do that. And we are meeting there 10 or 15 times. We, are the, we have 10 or 15 oral hearings and we are listening to the friends of the plaintiff who are describing how bad the media is and how it harm, made harm to the plaintiff. It's uh, absolutely it's not relevant to the case and it's bothering and uh, prolonging uh, the proceeding. And this is something what the judges they don't care, I would say. Somebody don't realize it, somebody don't care, and this is something that should be improved. Uh, sorry that it took so long, that's just my preliminary thoughts, and I will be happy to carry on. No, not, not at all. It, was, it wasn't long. We still have quite some time. So maybe I will just follow up on this, because I had a feeling uh, from Jana, what you said, from Bulgaria, that you have also feeling that there is a missing uh, not only experience, but practical uh, lack of knowledge, how to actually implement it. We've been discussing this with uh, Thomas, what he just said, uh, that uh, in Slovakia, we really feel the justices or the judges should be maybe taken separately, that the trainings, and that's actually the idea of uh, the follow-up in Slovakia to conduct training possibly also for judges. So my question is whether you would feel something like that uh, is an issue also in your country, and uh, you think... It's feasible because that's another question we might uh, face. Like one thing is whether you think it's important. Second, how feasible it is. It's important to be practically conducted. So maybe I pass the floor. I start with Viviana because you mentioned that maybe others can also join the discussion. But you think it's important to go farther than that? Yes, uh, definitely. The, there is such a need, and um, as I said, the the main issue and the key issue. Uh, Key determination, so to say, is to really to to find precise and clear uh, criteria to distinguish these kind of cases because this is one of the things we um, even in Bulgaria some of the lawyers uh, they call them uh, cases with elements of swap because it's not clear. I mean, it's not defined still. So this is one of the things that should be put on the first side because you can't defend you know, journalists or <laughs> human rights uh, uh, defenders, etc. if you can't define the, the case. Okay, okay, that opens another, another chapter, but let's follow the, the line which I uh, raised, whether you think the judges should be maybe approached in some stage of the project, maybe Maria and then Anushka tell us. Basically, the more people we train, uh, these are the judges or future judges, uh, or journalists, or uh, they should all be educated on, on what is slap and anti slap legislation and, and their needs, freedom of information, um, and public speaking. Um, so I think all, all these, if we're going to have a holistic approach to the whole topic, we, uh, we certainly need to open it up yeah. and uh, get this wider um, group or uh, aware, or even just the general public or even academics, because even academics in our own research sometimes, we are forced as to what we should and we sh shouldn't publish. So I think it is important that this issue is, is, does open up to a wider group of, of people. But would you exactly, exactly, I think that's, that's very good, a very good point. But do you think it would be even essential? Because we felt, that's why Thomas mentioned it, I, I fully support what he said, is 
we feel like it's even essential really to go farther than for the lawyers because lawyers are on one side of the problem but the, the essential part of the problem is that there is no real understanding from the side of the judges what does it mean what's the implementation so for us it looks like not that we would like to widen it which i fully agree but actually it's it's crucial step to get them involved uh, in order to this this process to, to be functional yeah, yeah. yeah? essentially mm -hmm. i think judges should be uh, uh whether it is feasible because you also said okay is it is it feasible exactly. okay that's maybe that's something that others can i uh, can look at whether mm -hmm. it is feasible mm -hmm. yes uh, if i may add um okay it depends on the system of each country so in cyprus because it's an adversarial system which means that um, issues are brought by the lawyers. Mm -hmm. I think it is very important for lawyers to understand what SLAP is. Mm -hmm. um, and because in order, f even if the judge knows the concept of SLAP, if lawyers do not argue it before him or, sh or her, um, it will not be included in the judgment. So uh, I think that uh, it is very important for lawyers I'm talking about Cyprus now, I don't know in other jurisdictions, for lawyers to understand in order to raise it in future cases. And then judges will become aware of it through uh, court, the court process. Of course, it is always a good thing uh, for everyone to be educated on uh, new uh, issues and uh, directives. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Sorry, if I yeah. can just add, um, following up from what Theodor has mentioned, maybe we can lobby that um, slab and anti-slab issues should be included in the bar training where we're getting new lawyers just like when they started quite a few years ago on anti-money on aml issues mm -hmm. and that was sort of implemented into the so maybe in the ethics uh, curriculum that lawyers have to pass maybe we can lobby that the slab issue should also be incorporated into that training very good idea. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anushka? Yeah. Um, I just want to say, like I already mentioned, one of the speakers in our event was also a judge from the High Court. And um, he, he said that of, he, he came to our training, so he is aware of slaps. Uh, but uh, his problem now is that now he doesn't have any tools what he can do if he's, he see that it's a threat. I mean, we were talking about, but nothing, uh, like there is no good tools uh, now. Uh, we will see what will happen after the, the, uh, um, after the, um, uh, the directive will be implemented, mm -hmm. but for now, we, I see. there's nothing. May I ask? Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I just want to confirm what uh, you said because uh, that's what came out in after the Bulgarian sessions and training. So the lawyers said, okay, this is very good. How can we use it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's good to have it, great. But what, what we can do with it, basically? So it's very much um, a matter of how it will be implemented in the domestic laws and legal systems and uh, what will be the tools and the measures that can be taken because otherwise it will just stay you know as a direct yeah, and you, you think that you think that they don't know about the legal domestic instruments or they are really not ones to they, be used? they can't really they're not aware still how they can use all of uh, them as measures but uh, also there was this feeling that uh, they can't really understand the, the the meaning of the directive, how it can help them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how it can be used in practice. That's a very good tool, that's a good point also for us because, for example, we didn't have Justin for our first training. Maybe it's important also to have him to in, in explain properly what the terminology is. Even for Tomar is the one who is commenting and in Slovakia the process maybe is a bit more open. The ministry is consulting some prominent lawyers, so they are involved in commenting it, so it's not really closed closed uh, channeling, uh, but definitely that might help. My, my one question would be if there are no comments on this uh, uh, for you, Anushka, because Slovenia is not that big country, Slovakia is not a big country, and I was a bit fascinated hearing that you had so such a big panel, actually, everyone being there, because for us, uh, we had some lawyers there, we want to have another group of lawyers, maybe different regions, 
also we plan to have a, a one training for NGOs, for media representatives, because that's for them. But I'm asking from the perspective that usually lawyers are really specified in some areas of the law. And uh, that you said that yeah, there was such a huge interest in Slovakia. Actually, we feel that yeah, there are some who, who are really interested in this topic, but there's not that many of them because Slovakia is actually limited number in the country. And uh, Tomáš is probably the most prominent one, so he is the most important. So how come that you brought actually such a big uh, scope? That was the question. I mean, big. I don't know what, <laughs> what you understand as big, but like on the uh, on the training which was mean just for lawyers, uh, like m more than 20 lawyers came. For, for us, this was a really great number. And they came like attorneys, and they came also from the, um, from the government and from uh, um, like different uh, lawyers. Um, uh, I think many came because we managed to get this professor. Uh, he's very known. Uh, and uh, I don't know. I I think maybe just we choose a good day, a good day. Yeah, that helps. That surely helps. And uh, also, legal network is uh, very known. Like and we work with lawyers for two years now. We work with attorneys for two years, so they know us. Very good. Uh... Excellent. Uh, maybe one, one question for, for the future. We still have some time uh, because we organize probably each of the organizations organize first set of trainings and we are preparing second one. Is there anything which you would like to change or what was maybe the lesson learned from the first training? What do you think should be added or should be done differently? Uh, or no, you were perfectly satisfied how it's how it run and uh, you would run it the same way. So maybe we'll start, Tomas, what do you think? Yes, yes. Uh, we have first uh, session after us uh, we organized that workshop in december it was a great experience for me but uh, uh, it was interesting ideas to hear that maybe some guests from other professions would be beneficial and could uh, give some extra value to these workshops it means if the prosecutor talking about uh, criminal proceedings and uh, slander defamation and also judges judges are very valuable persons and they are very complicated and difficult to get an invite somewhere and they are living in their social bubbles in Slovakia I mean literally they are trying uh, to make some distance from other professions uh, what's a pity so uh, definitely uh, we would uh, like to target and invite uh, some special guests and more lawyers because as it was said uh, there is very limited number of uh, legal professionals, attorneys, uh, dealing with freedom of expressions. In Slovakia, we have maybe seven or eight uh, large medias. So it means we are maybe eight law firms who are dealing with uh, these issues on a daily basis, maybe 10, 15 uh, lawyers, and the others are having just occasional impact and experience with this. So it's uh, very good and very beneficial for future clients, for the defendants, to have a broader pool of uh, professionals, of attorneys who can take their cases and help them. Because eight or ten people, it's really not enough. I mean, Slovakia has five million inhabitants. It's not a big country, but still, it's great to have people who are doing this with passion, who like and who believe in freedom of expression. This is the most and crucial key, I would say. And uh, if, I, if I may add, I, I realized one thing. Uh, we have in Slovakia last week, we had a very sad uh, anniversary. It was five years since the murder of journalist Jan Kuciak. And uh, our politicians uh, uh, celebrated it in a very special way with uh, frontal attacks on journalists in all fronts. Uh, now we are having a new criminal proceeding for threats uh, making uh, by uh, opposition politicians and by anonymous uh, people on internet uh, against uh, Slovak uh, public media and uh, TV anchor working there uh, just because uh, she was not accepting uh, some politician who wanted to get to some political debate. I mean, absolute crazy. So politicians are 
last years and its former prime ministers, two of them, they are just attacking journalists, they are spreading uh, hate speech, threats, and the mobs, the people, anonymous uh, people on the internet are just taking in over and uh, these uh, actions against journalists are getting more and more serious. What I realized, in my opinion, this is a new way of slap. Oh, really, I, I'm, not, I'm not joking because last two years since COVID, I had to help also other people and I had to defend uh, uh, doctors, scientists, uh, and some uh, activists who were fighting these conspirators and uh, they were just trying to protect themselves against this mob because it was really crossing the red line many, many miles. And slap, in my opinion, it's not just legal action. It's, just, it's also action, any action, frivolous action, which is trying to just harass the journalists or any other people acting in public participation and uh, making uh, hate speech via internet, via social media, and making threats and trying to spread fear. And many other people are following these threats and carry on. This is for me also slap which needs to be battled. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tomasz. Yeah. And any other thoughts on the lessons learned from the first training round? Yeah, Maria? Well, um, in Cyprus, which is a, a small country, a very small country, um, we, we, the first workshop was run uh, at the Law Institute uh, and it was basically to set the framework of mm -hmm. what is SLAP, anti-SLAP law mm -hmm. proposed directive. Um, the, the idea we have now with Theodoro is perhaps we can or, organize it in a different town to attract mm -hmm. a different crowd. Um, and also, uh, I think it's a great idea. Perhaps we can try and bring a judge or an ex-judge. Um, they are a prosecutor just to open up the panel and have more of a panel discussion because as Theodor has mentioned, a lot can be gained from a, a panel discussion and the group discussion um, and having this multidisciplinary approach. Uh, I, I think once, since we've met our quota of training law, uh, the lawyers mm -hmm. uh, as, as a country, right. then perhaps we can just open it up and, and get that knowledge across. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good one. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, Maria, uh, anything else? Um, in Bulgaria, the first uh, training we did was uh, mainly for uh, attorneys from Sofia, from all companies. Uh, we were thinking about the, the next one to include more people from the countryside mm -hmm. uh, because the, those would be the people to defend the, the regional journalists who are in much uh, really better um, position than the the people in the capital because uh, the journalists in Sofia they have the information they have much more tools for defendants and etc but the people in the the countryside really are victims of <laughs> terrible things so we are thinking of including more authorities from mm -hmm. from, regions. from the from the regions mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. um, if i may add um it would be a useful thing to share uh, experiences of slap cases. Because some jurisdictions, there are many cases. In other jurisdictions, there are no many, maybe known cases. So uh, it will be important for the participants to um, not only to learn the principles and the theory, but to, uh, to see um, a case, a case study, in order to understand and get into the shoes of the victims, understand why this directive and this initiative, it's very useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually a very good idea. That's actually a very good idea. I just can bring uh, one experience from our another project, which we are part in project, which is called Solution Journalism. This goes a bit farther than normal reporting because normal reporting sort of try to bring or spotlight some problem, and then it's up to political stakeholders or any other stakeholder to take action. While solution journalism is about showing the problem, but also showing the solution in some other environment where it's really functional. So this is exactly, and, and, and I'm mentioning it because there is a sort of database of solution journalism good stories, and uh, everyone can look at it and actually serves as a perfect feedback for you. You can also find some patterns, some uh, some uh, good uh, good inspiration. So I think yeah, that's for the possible for the future might be as an inspiration. 
I just want to maybe add, uh, I, I fully agree with what, what you said. We also try to sort of expand it to more regions, maybe to other layers. We also try to go maybe to the faculties of the of the legal faculties, not only in Bratislava, but also possibly in other regions, to bring this possibly or even aspirationally to some kind of a curriculum for the for the students in the faculties. As you mentioned, to the Bar Association, we organized our first training at the, at the venue of the Bar Association in Slovakia. They were very helpful in that. Uh, so thank you very much for them if they are following us now. But uh, I think it's very useful because through them, this information uh, was spread around. Uh, and now quite a regular media newsletter, which is published in Slovakia, they also reported about the, our activity in last week. Peace and exactly what Tomasz mentioned, uh, there is now a lot of discussion because we are facing elections, early election, probably at the end of September. And there is a lot of discussion what actually politicians, where are the, where are the limits of freedom of expression? It's not the only case in Slovakia, obviously. But unfortunately, we had this anniversary of fifth, uh, fifth year of murder of Jan Kuciak. And uh, once you would expect that politicians would be more measured in their speeches, now it looks uh, exactly opposite. So it's very good to speak about it because I'm mentioning it also from the context because when we're inviting uh, lawyers to our first training, we decided not to go for those who are sort of on a good side, uh, supporting cause of the freedom of expression, but also invite lawyers who might be actually defending the, the big companies because we believe that the quality journalism, quality and openness actually helps on all sides. So once they're one, all sides of the society are informed about these principles, it helps um, to protect them, to to, uh, to equip them with the with the some some tools which can be used. So uh, uh, I think that that was a very good panel. Thank you very much for that. I think uh, if anyone would like to add something, you're more welcome. But if not, thank you. Yeah, please. There is a question. Go ahead. Hi. Good morning. Um, I've noticed a bit of a variance in position between particularly the Cypriot position and the Slovak position, where I've noticed that the Cypriots have placed focus on defining what a slap is all about, and you've placed focus on educating lawyers, on telling them exactly what a slap is, and I find this may be counterproductive. What do I mean? If it walks like a duck and looks like a duck, it's a duck. I don't need to know that it has 473 feathers, and I don't need to count them to know it's a duck. So defining a slap too restrictively creates a problem, because when a bird comes along with 512 feathers, you can't, you've lost the definition. To me, a slap is very much a ju judgment call, which we as lawyers need to make when a case is presented in front of us. You look at the case and within two minutes you're able to assess whether the objective here is actually to achieve justice or whether it's simply one of harassment. So I'm, I'm, I'm more in tune with what Tomas has, has said before in the sense that um, we shouldn't just be looking here at strict libel suits or, or suits that are strictly to do with the media. The problem of slaps is far wider than that. There's, in my country, for instance, a huge abuse of freedom of information laws. There are abuse of data protection laws. It gets so wide that the minute you start going for a very prescriptive definition for what a slap is all about, suddenly you've, you've, you've hit a brick wall and the law starts becoming outdated. So I, I think it's crucial that if uh, the directive eventually gets off the ground and eventually gets... That, yes, it may be up to the, the national states to add more definition if they do so, but my position would be to leave the definition as wide and as open and to train lawyers in the sense to, to, to show them that slap suits and slap harassment comes in a million different shapes and form. And no doubt, the minute the directive is introduced, new forms are going to start surfacing. So I, I think it's important that we're aware of this, this kind of breadth to, to the situation. It's not simply libel suits and um, government ministers or, or big business targeting individual journalists. It's, it's actually more, far more developed than that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we, you are from... Sorry, I didn't introduce myself. So I'm Michael zamit Mempel. I'm from Malta. I'm a practicing attorney in Malta. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Yes. Um, I fully agree with you. Um, being in a common law country, actually, um, every case you create law. So, um, and you are also from a common law country. So, um, of course, the courts 
and the lawyers are those who will develop this directive and there is no uh, restriction in the definition. Um, what, uh, what um, I mean, the, the implementation of the directive, I don't think that the national authorities will define SLAB through the implementation. Uh, probably they will define the mechanism and the procedural uh, manner in which you can raise uh, any issue regarding the SLAB case. But I don't think that uh, the national authorities should even try to give their own definition on what a SLAB means, which I think it's quite clear from the directive, because uh, if we are talking about an um, unfounded and uh, groundless uh, claim, um, then you apply, of course, the national law and the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights to define whether this case is indeed groundless or not. So I fully agree that uh, there should be no restrictions because every case is different and every case has its own uh, facts and uh, challenges. Uh, so, yes, I, I agree. Uh, thank you very much, Theodoros. Yeah, that's a very good, uh, very good point. I think that uh, we're not going to solve it it's this or that way, probably. I mean, everyone has different approach. Every country has a different experience and a knowledge, I think, and also a different tradition. Uh, and uh, least but not least, uh, I don't want to go over a uh, coffee break. So, uh, but it's a good topic to discuss it further on because I fully agree. I mean, uh, we might have this issue now, but in one year in Slovakia it might be a different issue uh, being much more pending. So, uh, yeah, thanks you very much once again for question. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. And yeah, well, let's have a break probably. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go with the uh, session proposal building, uh, building a defense network uh, moderated by Anna Wawich from Oco Press as Polish NGO. Anna, please join us. And uh, Carla and Michael from uh, Malta, from Editus Foundation. And uh, uh, Cristina Lupo from Romania, from uh, the uh, Foundation Centro Pentru Journalism Independent. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for staying for the second session. Uh, and I have a pleasure to chair a panel discussion entitled Purposely Building a Defense Network. So we have 40 minutes and we'll have uh, four distinguished presenters here that will discuss their experiences with SLAPs um, and with uh, the training about them. So uh, let me introduce them. Uh, um, we, we are here with... Um, with uh, Michael Zamit um, Mempel, who is a practicing lawyer specializing in intellectual property, media freedom of expression and technology law. He has graduated uh, from the University of Malta and Queen Mary University London. And uh, he advises one of Malta's key media houses and also served as company secretary to the board of directors of that company. And he's particularly passionate about the regulation of internet content and the protection of free speech on digital platforms. So we are very happy to have you here. And uh, Carla Camilleri is a lawyer by profession and assistant director of Aditus Foundation, a non governmental organization established in 2011 with a mission to monitor, report, and act on access to human rights in Malta. Named for the Latin word for access, its work is focused on the attentive analysis of access to human rights recognition and enjoyment. Aditus is the Maltese partner of Patfox. And the next person is uh, Krzysztof Plusa, who is um, experienced um, legal counsel specializing in uh, defending journalists in Poland. And he has defended on many occasions Oko Press, um, where, uh, where I um, work, uh, where I contribute as a journalist. And um, Mr. Uh, Pluta uh, has been one of the, um, mm, the trainers in our um, workshop uh, held in Warsaw last November. Um, and um, the last person is um, Christina Lupu 
from uh, Foundation Central Pentru Journalism Independent uh, from Romania, and she is um, working on human rights issues related to freedom of expression on protecting uh, journalists' uh, rights. And I'm very happy to have you here. We have a very nice geographical uh, distribution. Let's say. <laughs> so um, the first is we have 40 minutes. Um, the first uh, question would be on the experience with slabs. And um, I will start with Malta. So, uh, Michael, um, the crackdown on media freedom and the rights of journalists in Malta is very well known. But can you tell us exactly what is the problem there and how the fact that you speak such a good English impacts on slab cases in your country and your work? Thank you, Anna. Um, yeah, so in the break, with, with Cyrus's permission, we were having a little interesting conversation over here on, on how uh, slaps have become very prevalent in, in, in Malta. And as I mentioned in my comment before, whereas we think that the obvious case would be libel suits, uh, in Malta we've seen a, a development happening in that they've taken on many different forms. So the key area still remains libel and defamation suits and uh, it's a little bit embarrassing that statistically we have the highest per capita rate of of this form of, of slap suit in, in the European Union but we've also seen a proliferation of abuse in the case of freedom of information laws and also in data protection laws and the way we see it working is apart from the visible side of things which are the lawsuits that end up before our law courts uh, as someone who works with, with journalists on a day-to-day -day basis, we are seeing a significant chilling effect. What do I mean by this? I mean that the fact that journalists can see what can happen to them and being dragged before court and spending five years fighting it out before the relatively slow Maltese justice system, we see a lot of journalists kill off their stories very early on. And this becomes a problem because even though, you know, as media houses, we try and attract the best talent, the best journalists, when you have those journalists who are fearful about what could happen to them because they think, I don't have the money, I don't have the energy, I don't have the patience to be dealing with this sort of thing. You find that a lot of stories start dying off very early on before the investigation can start happening. So it's created a problem uh, as I said before, not only with, with what is visible, not only with the lawsuits and with the judgments that are coming out of the Maltese courts, but also with what's happening behind the scenes. So as lawyers, we find ourselves having to attack um, or rather defend uh, our clients by, by uh, writing back to aggressive law firms or um, aggressive legal letters that we receive in this case. Now, Anna mentioned the, the, the language issue. And for Malta, this is a little bit particular because given that English is one of our national languages, one of our official languages, and given further that practically all our investigative journalism takes place in English, not in Maltese, makes us more visible. Because it means that the minute someone writes something in English on the internet, it is immediately picked up, crucially, by the United States and by the UK. And this is a problem because when it comes to forum shopping, when it comes to filing uh, slap suits, the US and the UK remain problem jurisdictions because of the exorbitant costs that, that are involved with these two systems and also because they are... I, I, we, we tend to think of London as being somewhat apart when it comes to the judicial system because it, it, it's a step above every other uh, legal system in Europe when it comes to costs. Um, I'll give you a case in point, um, and, and her name may come up from time to time, but on the day of Daphne Caruana Galizia's uh, assassination in, in Malta in 2017, on that very day, a slap suit had been filed against her in Arizona in the United States. Why? Because her, her blog, the domain name, was registered with GoDaddy, which is registered in Arizona, and therefore a manifestly slap suit was started off over there. Now, would this have happened if she were writing only in Maltese, would the reaction have been as immediate, as, as heavy? I'd like to think not. The that we, we, we are picked up by, by um, the international press so much more easily is, is a, an inhibiting factor. There's the flip side to this, and one of the things we have noticed in Malta, for instance, is 
whereas the rule set by our, con by our constitution is that if you address the administration in one language, you are to expect a reply in that language. So if I address you in English, reply in English, if I address you in Malta. We've noticed that politicians in Malta don't observe this rule. So they are faced by investigative journalists in English, and they deliberately reply in Maltese. And the answer over here is obvious. It's to go under the radar. Whereas the story is going out in the English version, the actual comments can never be reported on international media because Maltese is a language spoken by half a million people in Europe, which is insignificant. So slaps in Malta have this added dimension. The fact that they have spread so laterally into different forms, into different um, mediums. And the fact that the language is acting not, I mean, languages are usually a barrier. In our case, it's not a barrier. It's, it's put us on a stage which is uh, disproportionate to the country's size and to the country's uh, media industry. So I, I think that would be the best way I can describe the slap situation in Malta, the, the breadth of it and the added dimension of the language situation. Thank you very much. We may say that uh, Malta is jumping well above its weight when it comes to European politics and also slaps. We try. <laughs> uh, so my next question to uh, Christina, if we can stay uh, in Malta for, uh, for a moment. So how actually NGOs such as Editors Foundation can help to counter such threats and what was the place of the training in it? Hi, um, I come from a slightly different background to my colleague. Um, Michael was the legal trainer, so he's the expert on, uh, on media law. I work in a human rights NGO and we looked at SLAPs and um, uh, the SLAP training from a kind of rule of law perspective. So the idea is to, was to raise awareness, so raise awareness of SLAPs to the general public, to journalists, to NGOs, and also to maybe the younger practitioners who might not have been so... Um, so knowledgeable about the topic. We also wanted to train the Maltese um, uh, legal professionals as well. We're, it's quite a small community. Um, there are a, there's a very small community of lawyers who work in media law and libel law. And the idea is to train the younger lawyers to identify and to be more aware of how to defend um, slap cases. Um, and I think we, we managed quite well because there was a, a very good mix of people there um, um, present. Um, what we also wanted to highlight is that there is a draft directive um, and it is being worked on and hopefully will be presented soon um, and to kind of um, influence our local politicians to be aware of the directive and to know what um, our feedback was on, on, on the draft in order to possibly influence the outcome of the directive. Um, as editors, what we look at mainly as well is the, the institutional um, is the institutional structure of the courts and the tribunals that tend to look or hear um, uh, slap cases or issues um, uh, that are linked to slap cases. So, for example, um, FOI requests, freedom of information requests, who decides um, on the appeals, which tribunal decides on the appeals, and how are these people um, appointed to these bodies. And as with a lot of the administrative tribunals we have in Malta, many of these um, key positions are appointed directly by either the minister or the prime minister. So you would have, for example, the data protection commissioner appointed by the minister. You would have the the members of the Information and Data Protection Appeals Tribunal appointed directly by the Prime Minister um, uh, with no uh, security of tenure, which for us is extremely problematic. There is also the possibility to appeal to the courts. Um, uh, currently, the system is working quite well and it's quite fast. And the, the judiciary that are involved, because in Malta you would have specific uh, members of the judiciary looking at specific cases, there's always the possibility that the person, the, the member of the judiciary could be reassigned to another court and you would have a new member of the judiciary who might not be as knowledgeable on slaps or media law or libel law. Um, uh, so the idea would to make, um, where we would advocate to make the system tighter, more independent and more transparent. Thank you. So now, uh, Krzysztof, um, that's the case that I'm familiar with, uh, Poland. Uh, so you have an extensive experience that spans more than 20 years, so it goes well beyond the current rule of law backsliding and its problems with attacks on media freedom. Uh, so what would you say about the Polish slaps against media? What's, what's specific about them, if at all? 
Uh, I think that uh, Poland uh, is not a very specific country uh, if we talk about uh, Slavs problem. Uh, what was changed uh, lately, uh, it is a uh, radical increase of uh, litigations uh, in, initiated as a criminal proceedings. Uh, I heard that it is a wider problem. Um, I think that it is only Polish problem, but, but uh, in the reports of other colleagues, especially from Slovakia, I heard that, that it is wider, wider, wider problem. Um, I can say that uh, I cooperate with media uh, as his journalist and media editors for 1995. It's uh, almost 30 years. And uh, until uh, 2015, I have met two cases in my practice um, performed uh, as uh, criminal uh, proceedings. Two cases. F two or three years ago, I have one week when I received uh, three cases initiated as a criminal proceeding. Uh, and of course, I can observe from, from newspapers and from my own uh, practice that the uh, practice initiations, the litigations per performed on the base of criminal law uh, became uh, a rule. A few, few years ago, it was rather uh, exceptions. It is the change. Thank you very much. That's very sobering um, finding. Um, and uh, what about the main challenges um, for uh, journalists' work in um, uh, Romania, and how do you help to uh, make their life less miserable? Being in such a complicated uh, panel with Malta and Poland may seem that Romania is a good case scenario. So on paper, we don't have so many uh, slap cases. We, um, the journalists are not harassed on the level it happens. It happens in Poland, for example. We didn't have any journalists killed yet. Uh, but um, the situation is not that happy for, for, for the Romanian journalists because we don't know the number of slap cases because we don't count them and uh, there is no, uh, no st official statistic on what's, uh, what's happening with, uh, with slap in Romania, but we see that more and more journalists are, are harassed uh, we have um, clear cases of slap against journalists, against human rights activists, and uh, against um, citizens posting on their blogs, for, uh, uh, for example. So uh, in, the same, uh, uh, in the same time, we look with a lot of worry uh, as a, a freedom of expression uh, NGO and an organization who tries to protect journalists at what is happening around the, um, uh, the region because you can't be uh, in a bubble. So if you say that the journalists are uh, protected in Romania and the politicians don't sue them, you don't look uh, on, uh, at, the, uh, at the right uh, uh, data. We have um, the, the investigative journalists are sued are, um, if they can't be bought because uh, these days in Romania, it's easy by the, politician, uh, par, uh, by the politicians to use public money to buy a lot of advertising within the, uh, within the media. So uh, if they can't be bought, they are sued. And there is a famous um, case. It's also the case study that we had at, uh, at CIJ. The, one of the main newsrooms in the country had in the last four, three years, for example, uh, 20, 30 cases of uh, uh, politicians and people suing them for their, uh, their investigations. There is a mayor that sued the same newsroom and journalists for 20 times. Uh, they filed also criminal uh, complaints. Uh, they filed... Uh, um, uh, they, they wrote to the anti-discrimination uh, council in Romania saying that uh, they discriminate because they are reporting about him. Um, he lost 
all uh, all the cases in the um, even in some cases he win during the first stage of the of the trial but the newsroom appeal and they um, the cases were dismissed but this is troubling because Libertata, this is the newsroom that uh, I'm, I'm speaking about. It's a big newsroom. They have the money. They are one of the few newsrooms that can afford legal fees. But in Romania, the journalists are very poorly paid. And to afford a lawyer, it's something that it's not really um, uh, easy for uh, for a journalist so this is why we see self censorship as you said and you see we see also that some journalists decide maybe that it's easier not to report about that thank you Yes, very, very short. Yes, comment, very briefly, please. because there's something that uh, our colleague from Poland mentioned and which has struck a chord with what's going on in Malta. So he mentioned criminal libel. Now, in Malta, we have the experience of having removed criminal yeah. libel from our statute books. What's happened? We have computer misuse. So these days, politicians file an action for computer misuse, for el use of electronic communications, which means you've used the blog, or you've sent an email, or you've uploaded an online article, and get back to the journalist by using a different provision of the law, with the exception that the, the penalties for, criminal, for computer misuse are 10 times as much. Yeah. So we've solved one problem by removing criminal libel, and now opened up another door in another way. So this is how, how refined the, the yeah. system has become in, in really getting to journalists at every level. Now, when you, when you think, again, and I'm going to mention her name, because it, it's, when you think like uh, someone like Daphne Karangalitsa was working only on her blog, you can understand how severe the situation was. I mean, again, my colleague from Romania mentioned 20 lawsuits on one day. Her record was 19 from one person regarding one article. So it, 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 it just goes into so many different ramifications, so many different examples that it, it, it's often difficult to get your head around it. I, sorry, I thought I'd come uh, in with that. I, 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 sorry, <laughs> I, it's the same happening in Romania. We managed to uh, kill, as we say, the uh, defamation from the criminal code. But for example, a few months ago, a journalist was uh, pros not pros investigated after he published uh, uh, an article um, about a, a person abusing a kid. And he was investigated by the criminal, uh, by the prosecutors for um, uh, Pedophilia and uh, promoting yeah, pedof pedophilia, and uh, because he published some of the videos on uh, his uh, 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 website with all the identities, identities uh, uh, covered, uh, all the, the measures, and all her co his computers, all the IT e equipment was seized. Okay, um, we'll have uh, like less than 10 minutes left. So I'll just uh, now briefly uh, ask you for one minute recollection of the most rewarding and challenges elements of the SLAP training that you participated in, conducted. So, I mean, Carla mentioned before, Malta is perhaps the smallest country over here and our legal community is even smaller. But I think what was uh, satisfying about uh, the audience that we had for our SLAP training is that we had key people working in the uh, in the in the area so we had three very senior lawyers who between them you know have have quite a chunk of the the liable market over there but we also had a, a number of new faces uh, and I think one of the most positive elements is that they could relate to having role role models over there there was there were, the fact that there were a mix of senior and junior lawyers meant that they could see how other people have been handling things before them um, I think perhaps that was the most rewarding element. The most disappointing element was that we had uh, a huge number of people who made reservations and, and a high number of dropouts who didn't show up. But, you know, nonetheless, we were satisfied <laughs> with, our, with our turnout. Over to you. Christina. I concur with what Michael said. I think another really positive element was that we had an NGO, so the Daphne Carano Galizia Foundation NGO, actually explaining what it's like to be at the receiving end of a slap so practitioners could see what it's like to be from the victim side, but also the fact that they informed us that um, uh, they, as an NGO, they offer their services to journalists to be the front of the questions being asked. Because they have such clout, they can afford to ask questions in, in, in any type of reportage. 
So I think that was really interesting for, for the people present. Um, and a, a challenge, well, I think, as Michael said, the capacity um, that people did not turn up. We hope that if we move it online, uh, we will have much more uh, participation. Krzysztof? Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, we, uh, mm, uh, uh, we took other options, uh, other philosophy of invitation for our training, because uh, we decided to invite uh, people outside of Warsaw, because uh, we recognize that people in Warsaw better at worse, but manage it, manage with, with slap. Uh, the worst situa situation is people living outside of, of the capital, outside of uh, many connections, links, lawyers, supporters, etc., etc. And it was our philosophy. We invited people outside of the capital. Uh, it was very interesting uh, experience. Um, what uh, what was main challenges? I, I think that uh, we have two, uh, two, cha two challenges. First, uh, it was uh, the problem. For me, it was a problem that, in, in my opinion, as an attorney, we have no tools against SLAP. We have only tools against our opponent in the litigations which we perform for for, uh, in, in the case uh, for uh, protection of uh, good name. We have no, we have no addi additional tools and our strategy, strategy as a lawyers is completely the same. We have no tools how to recover a huge amount of money which are uh, borne by, by publisher uh, or uh, journalists, we have no any legal rules how to recover this cost, how to recover time we spent many years for performing the case. It's a very big frustration, but it is, it is this, uh, uh, this challenge which was difficult to me, how to, how to say uh, something uh, interesting for uh, those people who come for training, and say them that I have no idea how, how to help. Uh, the second problem for us, uh, and it appeared in, in our dis discussion when we, pre uh, we uh, prepared uh, before the training, was that uh, we were afraid that if we talk too much, we prepare a very good instruction for slappers. And and the problem was how to do it. Yes, I can attest to that. Uh, we had big discussions. There were several people who tried to like infiltrate our workshop, so we were engaged in like vetting all potential candidates. And Christina, what's your experience? Um, we started with the idea that we will not have that will be complicated to find lawyers to be that are interested in slabs and we received more than 100 requests we are a, a big country but 100 requests were uh, a lot uh, this is why uh, we decided that we'll have three trainings instead of uh, instead of two uh, we had the same uh, idea philosophical idea how to have a training to help uh, lawyers to understand uh, SLAP, but not to give the tools to the people who would want to use the information and abuse it uh, against, uh, against journalists. So for us, it was, uh, we worked a lot with the local media. We invited them to um, uh, extend the invitation to their lawyers because the local media in Romania is uh, very vulnerable. And we prioritized in our first trainings locals, uh, lawyers that work already with, uh, with, with media and with uh, local media. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, five minutes left, but I uh, promised to, to give floor to Michael. I, I wanted to share, if I may, with the room, uh, one of the key conclusions that uh, 
our training in Malta ended up with, with a full room discussion, uh, given that there were lawyers who, who work in the field. And there was one element on which everyone was in full agreement. And that is the element of um, that the, the directive may not work for smaller jurisdictions like Malta, because everyone believed that there should be uh, a way of stopping cross-border um, suits by enforcing the rule that the defendant must be sued in the country of origin. So the only way to do this was to introduce this principle as a, as, as a principle of public policy, because it's the only way that uh, a directive or, or a rule coming from outside the country, shall we say, um, can, can, be, can be within the control of that jurisdiction. But uh, I was actually surprised that there was such general uh, unanimity on this and how strongly people felt about it. People felt that so long as the directive remains in its current form, there is still going to be a million loopholes of getting around um, the system. So I, I, you know, I'd be interested in hearing maybe that was the experience in any other training that, that took place across Europe, but it was certainly our experience in Malta. Okay, well, let's, let, let's return to that. But first, let's check if there is any question from the audience. No, okay. So I have the last question, but I also ask you to be brief. So uh, the, the title of this panel is how to build a defense network. And that's a tricky thing. So what's particular in trying to build such a network regarding slabs, judging from your experience uh, with those trainings? Uh, do you have experiences with other like networks of lawyers ad hoc or more formal? formal? I'll let Carla elaborate on this, but certainly, at least in Malta, there is quite an element of collegiality between lawyers working in the field. So we do cooperate with each other and we do share our knowledge base with each other because we realize that, you know, today it may be my turn, but tomorrow it's going to be your turn. And unless we sort of watch out for each other, uh, something needs to be done. We are. We also advise clients. Um, Carla mentioned the Daphne Caruana Galizia Foundation. Uh, who have set up networks of lawyers. So, for instance, the Daphne Foundation has set up um, a panel, uh, a team of lawyers who are available to offer pro bono advice to those journalists or anyone who feels aggrieved by a slap, and they, they offer free legal clinics in that sense. Uh, Carlo also mentioned before, and it's, it's, it's quite innovative on our scene, in that uh, the Daphne Foundation has decided to step um, step up and take the heat for a lot of the investigations. So where it knows that journalists are feeling intimidated or threatened, it invites those journalists to go through them. They will ask the questions because they've now developed a thick skin and a very uh, oily set of shoulders. They will take on the questions themselves and they will take the heat themselves. And that keeps the journalist hidden. So it's another method of how uh, this form of network and collaboration is starting to produce results. Cara, I don't know if you had anything to add on. Maybe just on the lawyer or the defence networking, you know. I mean, we as an NGO, we work on broad, on a number of issues, migration, asylum, but also rule of law. Um, I think we, we really base a lot of our work on networking, both on the European angle, but also on the local angle. So um, we are part of, of European networks where at times we file cases together and at times other European lawyers would intervene on our cases, say, in Strasbourg. So it is, it is key, you know, the, the actual networking is key for information, for support, and also for keeping each other updated on what is going on at a European angle, but also at a national angle, angle especially when it comes to EU law, obviously what is going on in another member state could affect what is going on in your country or in a, in a case you might be bringing forward uh, to other institutional levels. So I would say it's key. Uh, Christoph, can you comment on Poland? I, uh, I understand the building of a network uh, very broadly. Um, very broadly, uh, uh, I, I mean uh, that it, it should be linked not only uh, professional lawyers uh, who are able uh, to perform the, the uh, professional defense, but also other entities, uh, other entities uh, who are able to uh, support the victim of uh, slap 
the um, in financial way or uh, other entities who operates uh, in the area of PR. I think that especially PR is very important tools in uh, fighting against slap. I have to um, I have to uh, um, say very shortly about the, the biggest case uh, which I uh, have possibility to to help with. Uh, in 2000, 2005, uh, one of big financial uh, institution in Poland sued my client for uh, damage in amount uh, five million Polish water. It was today five million Polish water is over one million euro. Uh, for Polish conditions, is huge amount of money, and uh, this amount cause that uh, the newspapers, uh, other, uh, other editors started to write about this case, started reported this case to public opinion. And uh, these opinions reported to public opinion was uh, not good for the plaintiff. Uh, from the PR point of view, we win this case. We win this case, uh, we win this case uh, completely, but in this moment, we, uh, in front of public opinion, we will be the, the winner. What, what happened next? The, uh, the same uh, entity and other people connected with the plaintiff, and they initiated uh, in next uh, 20 years, next 13 litigations. And in none of them, they demanded such amount of money. Uh, after after this history, they demanded only 20,000 Polish zloty. It is about 4,000 euro. It is effect of PR tools. Thank you very much. And Christina, experience from Romania. I think we need, uh, as uh, uh, the others already mentioned, to bring more people to the table. So. We need to, to, to have more lawyers that are interested in supporting journalists, and this is why training is important, because uh, if we look, I can count on the fingers of my hand, the people that are now the to-go uh, lawyers for, for journalists within the country, so they are too little and they are too, uh, way too busy to, uh, to, uh, to be able to, to support all the journalists that would need uh, their, uh, their legal assistance. So I think we need more people to understand, more lawyers to understand why uh, this is important. But also we need to bring other actors to this network, to this coalition, um, international organizations as, uh, uh, that protect journalists need to be, or national organizations need to be more outspoken on the issue and to raise the, uh, the awareness on why silencing journalists is bad for democracy. Uh, and I think this is something that it should be, uh, it should be done more in Romania and I think around the, uh, around the region, especially because these days is a trend to be against what's coming from EU. And if you let politicians put uh, this narrative that this is something that intervenes within our uh, judiciary system, this is something that will do whatever bad things, you will, uh, you will let, them, uh, let them win and you will, uh, uh, the, the journals will be more affected. And we need to prepare in Romania, and this is, I think, the most particular case, Next year, it's a year when we have five elections. All election, elections happen in the same time. This means that the cases against journalists will skyrocket because we see the connection between elections and swing journalists. Thank you, everyone. We've run out of time, but I feel that we've done a little bit to this PR exercise to explain a little bit what is uh, the potential of uh, training, uh, of discussing together about uh, SLAPs and also anti-SLAP directive. So I'm uh, very positive that we will keep in touch. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to the next panel. Thank you. Thank you, uh, dear colleagues.
Uh, hello to everyone. I'm Sanya Pajc from Gong, a Croatian watchdog organization, and I will be moderating the panel call responding to a difficult external environment. Everything so far has been very interesting, and I hope that we will not disappoint you. And after all, we will be talking about Croatia and Hungary, two neighboring countries, uh, each with their own different problems. I'll pick up where uh, Vanya, our trainer, <laughs> left, and then Shandor and Bea will present their issues. According to a report published by the Croatian Journalist Association in uh, March 2022, uh, there were around 1,000 active lawsuits in Croatia against the media. And in the vast majority of cases, uh, these are libel proceedings. And in total, the damages claimed from reporters and newspapers amount to more than uh, 10 million euros. And this is not a complete figure because many media outlets did not respond to the questionnaire that the Croatian uh, Journalists Association sent for their own reasons. And this is a very high number compared to the number of inhabitants and compared to what happens in uh, other countries in the European Union. So why is this the case? Um, this could be because Croatia is a young democracy and the importance of media freedom and uh, freedom of expression has not yet been fully recognized. We know that with great power comes great responsibility, but uh, low political culture makes the representatives of the legislative, executive and judicial power believe that they are not to be questioned in performing their, their duties, let alone criticized for what and how they do. They often fail to understand that the boundaries of permissible criticism are much wider when it comes to performing such duties. And if you try to speak out, uh, be prepared to find an envelope in your mailbox. <laughs> and there's one thing that differentiates slaps in Croatia from those in Europe, and that is that they are often initiated by judges. Osi County Court President Zvonko Verban has been named uh, the European Bully Lawyer of the Year by case last year because of a series of lawsuits uh, against, uh, that he filed against the Croatian Telegram uh, news portal, journalists and reporters, amounting to around uh, 100,000 euros. And his slats were even a topic of discussion at the Council of Europe media platform. And one of the most recent and high profile cases in Croatia involves three portal journalist, uh, Daorka Blažević, one of the most respected and experienced Croatian journalists. She was sued by former Supreme Court uh, President uh, Senka Klarić Baranoj, now a judge at the Supreme Court, for publishing information that was already known to the public. And in the column portrait of the week, uh, Mrs. Blažević made a comment regarding all Supreme Court decisions rendered while Judge Klarić uh, was head of the Supreme Court. And Mrs. Blažević was sentenced to a fine of uh, around uh, 5,300 euros. And in light of this event, the Croatian Journalist Association organized crowdfunding uh, for Mrs. Blažević's fine and the required amount of money was of course collected. However, the column portrait of the week on Tris Portal does not exist anymore because journalists are afraid of new lawsuits that would potentially follow in case someone such as that judge was tackled in there. And this is just one example of how powerful slaps are in silencing the media, which is already under high pressure in Croatia. And Gong even has a whole research about that. And in light of this event, the Croatian Journalists Association announced it would start publishing the names of judges who initiate slaps against journalists. And it is expected that the list will be available maybe in April this year. And even uh, the president of the Supreme Court in Croatia realized that slaps are a big issue in Croatia and filed a questionnaire to all uh, judges or presidents of uh, county court uh, county courts in Croatia, asking, among other, for data on lawsuits initiated by judges against journalists in the last five years. 
He notes that every judge has a right to sue a journalist if he believes, he or she believes that he or she defamed him. But the issue is that very high sums were being demanded in these lawsuits. Also, judges do not go to the court of honor of the Croatian Journalist Association, which would be part of the regular procedure if the article in question was unprofessional. And any lawsuit filed by a judge against the media is not only his or her personal matter, because the reason uh, for it is always the judge's conduct in that official capacity. And because of this, because uh, their lawsuits are a matter of their own courts, judges should refrain from filing lawsuits in a hectic manner. And the European Court of Human Rights found that inappropriate, extremely high compensations that judges regularly award to each other uh, were an issue in Croatia, thanks to the case of the Naroni List outlet uh, that was sued by a number of judges, which changed the previous judicial practice. And after the court's decision, instead of uh, the extremely high sums, uh, now usually around 4,000 euros is requested, which ends up at uh, 1,500 to 2,500 uh, euros. And the court again pointed out that the boundaries of permissible criticism of judges are wider than those that apply to ordinary citizens. And what we in Gong call for is forming a sort of evidence, register, whatever you may call it, uh, with information or judgments that are results of slaps with emphasis on those that were initiated by judges. Education of lawyers, especially judges, as Vanya also pointed out, uh, of course, is crucial for understanding the problem of slaps and how to recognize them, so that how to recognize them. And we also call for more regulation regarding media outlets uh, so that they bear the cost of the fines of their journalists because they must stand behind, behind their journalists. And finally, improving political culture through civic, uh, civil education, which uh, Gong has been advocating for decades, is necessary to understand the importance of freedom of expression. So it's crucially to properly address the issue of slaps because if we are not able to speak up when those in power are not behaving accordingly, then how can we really grow as a society? So this will be all from me now, and I'd like to give the word to Bea and Shanda. Thank you very much, Sanya, for, for the introduction. And as you described in this panel, we are uh, uh, focusing on how to in implement an anti-slap project in a, a difficult uh, environment, and we are tackling two countries, two neighboring countries, uh, Croatia and Hungary. And you rightly emphasize that there are significant differences between those two countries, though we are in neighboring countries. And as I understand, the issue in Croatia is this high number of slap cases by judges, which is quite unique. And we have some other, other issues. And you also emphasize that Croatia is a young democracy. OK, Hungary is another young democracy. But I need to tell that for a decade or so, this country has been moving towards more and more autocracy. And I presume that in this room, uh, you're all aware of the worsening rule of law situation in Hungary. And that has seriously affected the media sector, the judiciary, also independent civil society organizations which, by the way, can be very easily targets of slap cases as well. And I'm uh, managing uh, the Center for Independent Journalism in Budapest, which is a media development NGO. We were established 27 years ago to promote fact-based and ethical reporting via training, advocacy, and, 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 and research. And when we started in the mid-90s, I mean, we were operating in a very enabling and positive environment, and we were very proud that uh, those days Hungary and Poland used to be the front runners of democratization. Obviously, now we live in a very, very different situation. And regarding media, the most important feature is the capture of the media by, by the states. And according to estimations, some 80% of the media outlets are directly or indirectly com controlled by, by the governments and those media outlets which should serve the public, they are practically, practically disseminating the narratives of the government. Also, 
the country has a, uh, uh, like the media and advertising market in the country is distorted and the main advertiser is practically the state itself. So this is sort of the situation, but on the positive side, we still have a bunch of decent independent news outlets which are committed to the professional standards of fair reporting. At the same time, these outlets are operating under tremendous financial pressure. Also, these outlets have very limited access to data of public interest, to government information, and also they are occasionally targets of smear campaigns. So, uh, so when we are talking about slap cases, I mean, we have to understand and analyze it in this context. And my colleague, Bea Bodrogi, will talk more about the slap cases and the details. Let me just mention, emphasize in the end that we are glad to be part of this consortium. And like the other partners, we also uh, produced uh, curricula, implement uh, resource materials, and uh, had a pilot workshop for judges, which went quite well. And uh, Bea Bodogi is our uh, lead legal expert in this project, who is also a member of the EC expert group. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm, I'm happy to be here and share my experiences on SLAP with you. Uh, when preparing for this uh, discussion, I thought uh, that it would be the best to give you uh, an example of what I worked on the la on last year concerning uh, SLAP, uh, because I provide legal representation for three major independent media outlets, uh, and one of them is called Telex, and they employ 60, uh, no, 80, 80 journalists. And last year we had an election, so during election time, uh, legal cases grow almost, almost every country, but uh, especially in Hungary last time we could detect that uh, there was a really growing uh, number of cases against uh, journalists. And one of uh, a typical case against uh, this Telex, this independent uh, news portal was done or uh, initiated by by a Gongo, uh, government organized, non-governmental organization, uh, which, is, which spread actually the government messages on, on Facebook. And they spent uh, 80 billion Hungarian foreign on advertisement uh, to spread government messages on, on Facebook. And uh, one of the journalists at Telex wrote an article, an investigative article, and revealed that they use public money. And uh, this Gongo initiated three legal procedures uh, against uh, uh, this uh, media outlet. So this is, uh, and at the same time, uh, they started a smear campaign uh, against a journalist, which was run on Facebook and also through private uh, messaging as well. Uh, and the other part of my job, and this is a clear slap case. Uh, I think we can we can see if if they initiate, you know, three similar uh, legal procedures on the same uh, statement, then. Um, uh, we can say this is quite an abusive uh, type of um, proceeding. You know, the article published or reported about the public matter during uh, um, during a, during the period of election uh, period. And the other type of my work uh, concerned GDPR related cases, which we all know that uh, GDPR and administrative proceedings are not covered uh, in the directive. And we all know that directive uh, has it, its limits. Uh, but we could see that there is a growing number of um, uh, cases which are based on GDPR. And uh, in these type of cases, as a lawyer, you have, when you get a, sub, uh, a claim for, from, from anyone who claims that her personal uh, rights were violated under the GDPR, as a lawyer, you have to provide uh, a legal reasoning, a balancing between these two fundamental rights, which means that in every case when, when a media outlet receives uh, a GDPR-related claim, then you have to spend hours and hours uh, 
to write back and write a, a legal reasoning, which, which is nonsense. And uh, when we talk about uh, slap cases, you know, when we talk about the directive, uh, it's important to, uh, to realize and to, to, to take into consideration that, that it has its limits, but still we really have to broaden up the uh, discussion what slap is, because uh, just because the directive covers uh, uh, civil cases, cross-border uh, civil cases, doesn't mean that we don't have other type of slap type of uh, slap type of cases. So I fully agree with Michael and with Hannah. You all, you all said that uh, we need to talk about in a broader, in a wider uh, perspective what SLAP is, because just because directive doesn't cover administrative and criminal procedures, we know that all these type of cases might be considered as, as SLAP. And uh, for this reason, when we did the training for lawyers, uh, you know, we introduced the directive, we introduced uh, also the recommendation, which I have to um, highlight that it's, it's a great approach, that, uh, that the Commission took the holistic approach. It not only focuses on, on legal aspects, the directive, it, it also focuses on, on recommendations, uh, which we all know, you know, recommendations have their limits as well, because uh, you know, countries cannot be forced to follow these recommendations, but highly recommended to follow these recommendations, and uh, which say that uh, all legal uh, regulations should be re re uh, revised and renewed from SLAP perspective point of view. Uh, and what we did uh, during our trainings, we, beside introducing uh, the directive itself, we we stress quite a big focus on, on, on how to balance between two rights, because by at the very end, you have to explain. Th this is the core issue, balancing between two rights, when it comes to GDPR, when it comes to civil and criminal proceedings. So this is what I find really relevant in um, providing trainings to judges, lawyers, to, to come back to the basic uh, knowledge and to, to teach this basic knowledge. Article 10 of uh, the European Court of uh, uh, Human Rights case law. So this is what I found very useful uh, to, you know, to talk about case law, uh, which relates to the directive, but also relates to those slap type uh, of cases uh, which are not covered uh, under the directive, but we have to face them as well. Thank you. Uh, Vanya would like to add something now. It's not completely related, but I was asked to convey a message uh, from my colleagues at Case Coalition who couldn't be here today because their flight got cancelled last night. So they asked me to extend an open invitation to all of you here uh, to join the case coalition and to work together uh, on everything slap related. Uh, they are really great uh, and very experienced um, uh, experts uh, on different matters regarding slap. So here it is. It's uh, their message to you, um, you are openly uh, invited to join the case coalition. So that's it. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions? And we're running out of time, so I'd like to say thank you. Thank you, Shandra. Thank you, Bea. And that's all from us. Great. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the last panel. Um, my name is uh, Philip Wissing. I am working for uh, Blueprint for Free Speech, and I'm the coordinator of Pathfolks in Germany. And I have to my right Alessia Skiavon, who is the, um, from FIPCA, the um, coordinator of the Pathfolks project overall. You all might, might know her already. And she's also responsible for the implementation of the project in Spain. And I have also with me uh, Dr. Nadine Dienig, uh, who is attorney at law uh, in Germany with a focus on press and media law, competition and trademark law, and uh, she's also one of the two trainers for, uh, from Pat Fox in Germany for the uh, trainings. And I'm uh, really happy to have you both here for this last panel, which is um, 
yeah, called Slabs Environmental Activism and Human Rights Defenders. And we thought to start off with some remarks on the general context of Slabs in our two countries, Germany and uh, Spain. And Alessia will begin with some thoughts of the situation in Spain. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Uh, well, um, the situation we have encountered in Spain is very similar to um, some of the scenarios we um, have been reporting today. There are some com common points, let's say, between the, our country, even though the situation is uh, in each country is different, is peculiar. But um, the first thing that I can say about the context and uh, relating to the first session we had today is that when we started the project in February last year in Spain, um, we detected a general lack of knowledge about about the phenomenon, uh, starting from the very understanding of the meaning of the word, of the meaning of, of the term. Um, in general, Spaniards are not um, used uh, to adopt foreign terms, and it may uh, seem irrelevant uh, to do this uh, um, analysis about the use of the term. But I think it's important uh, when you have to start a conversation of phenomenon, you need to label the phenomenon first. And um, so um, Spanish is a very resistant language, so they, they need to translate things, and there is no acronym that you can use when you translate the entire expression into Spanish. So they start to use other terms uh, like demandas mordata, which is like gang close with, and this great confusion. So what I want to say that when we started the project, there was a big confusion about even the, the meaning of the term, and uh, at the general level, but even between among lawyers, um, not the few legal professionals that are working on, on slap related cases, but lawyers in general. Um, there, there are also uh, something that I, I can tell you more in terms of uh, the general understanding of the phenomenon. Uh, uh, um, number of articles that we, the number of articles that we um, uh, we found out at the beginning of the project that were mentioned in slap or this uh, Spanish way of uh, indicating the phenomenon are very low, um, less than 10, probably f five or six. Um, media also were not speaking about the phenomenon. Um, there was no um, legal article speaking about that. There was no interest from the academics. Um, there's still no uh, articles published by academics. There is one that is forthcoming <laughs> that will be published in two months. Uh, so there is no data collection about an, an analysis, of course, of slap cases. Um, so that lack of, uh, of knowledge about the, the phenomenon was um, the, a big challenge for us because we had to start from the very beginning to interview people. And the reaction was the, the feedback were very positive <laughs> on one side, the lawyers that were in a way um, uh, involved in defend in the defense of, of slap related cases i I'm, I'm using this this expression slap related cases because sometimes i uh, had the impression and I still have this impression that they, there is um, it's, it's challenging for them to um, understand the peculiarities of, of slap lawsuits there are different form of attack against freedom of expression and uh, uh, also, uh, Spain is a country uh, which has uh, some sort of difficulties in terms of attacks at uh, the, uh, the freedom of expression. And Spain has been condemned several times by the European Court of Human Rights for violation of the freedom of expression. So what we have done at the beginning is uh, starting to, to analyze the um, cases or trying to, uh, to collect data. And one interview led to another one and uh, lawyers and also victims were very uh, glad that uh, we have the Pathworks project in, in Spain and also that Pathworks project is a European project. On the other hand, I have to say that especially one victim, uh, I think it is the victim of what I consider the, mo the most important that case in Spain. It's not about the environmental activism. Uh, and this person told me that uh, is was open to help us. 
uh, to collect data about these cases, to have, uh, we have a series of, a series of discussion and debates about the, uh, the challenges, uh, not only legal, but also the personal one this person faced during four years. But at the end, he didn't participate in our um, training uh, workshop, even though we, in, invited the, we invited this person. Uh, this person decided not to come um, for the fear of being targeted again. And it's something we have to consider when we start analyzing the, in the phenomenon in a country where there is no data and you start labeling person and labeling phenomenon and cases. We, um, that's one of the challenges that we, we are still facing in, uh, in, in Spain. Uh, regarding the cases, more or less uh, from this uh, uh, initial analysis we have conducted in the first year, we're still conducting, I can tell you that um, the majority of the cases are uh, cases um, brought by corporation or public officials against um, journalists. Uh, in this case, the, the tool used is criminal law, mainly uh, criminal provision uh, on crimes and uh, uh, crime on discovery and disclosure of secrets. Uh, and there are also cases against activists, academics and activists. Uh, in this case, uh, again, the tool is uh, the criminal law, the criminal provision on honor crimes and honor offenses, and also the civil law provision, the protection of honor. Uh, among the, this target, uh, the activists in general, um, human uh, rights defender, we have noted that in last year, um, activists, uh, um, environmental activists, are being prosecuted or sued more often. And several cases happened in the early 2000s. Uh, we interviewed, for example, an environmental lawyer <laughs> uh, suffered an abusive litigation, first instance and second instance, in the 2004-2006 um, for defamation and slander. And it was, um, it was a, a criminal lawsuit for defamation. And this, this mining company that was prosecuting him, they wanted to sue him for uh, um, reporting the improper uh, disposal methods implemented by, by the company, demanding uh, 300,000 euros for what at the time was uh, the person job, because it was responsible inside a, a public administration of reporting these uh, um, environmental abuses. On the other hand, uh, we have two cases that have made headlines uh, in the last year. Uh, one case is the case of an environmental activist from the north of Spain um, who received, uh, a, again, a, a lawsuit from a direct company, one of the biggest direct companies in the world, asking 1 million euros uh, in damages after the activist uh, appeared on national television criticizing the irrigation practices used by the company, but its criticism was based on the scientific evidence. And uh, um, this lawsuit was part of a broader campaign of intimidation um, because in the last two years, in the same area, geographical area, other activists and also scientists, as someone mentioned before, these uh, the specific targets, uh, reported the same abuses, uh, um, received um, and then reported to, to the, the threat letters received by by other groups or, or uh, um, individuals with strong ties with this company. Uh, in, even though the, the, the conciliation hearing uh, that is like a pre prelim, preliminary <laughs> of the preliminary hearing uh, in the legal uh, Spanish legal framework when it comes to uh, defamation cases, uh, the activists did not retract um, everything critical, I say, during the, uh, the program on national television. The diary company decided not to proceed because at the end they, they reached the, the, the goal that they have. They scared the activists. It, this person is still active, but it's not acting as, as before. Um, so they are not. They were not interested in uh, in um, in having a, a real case in in court because they um, they already reached the, the goal. The other case is the. Um, very recent case, um, again, a dire company, again, in the north of Spain. In, in this case, it's not a lawsuit against an individual, 
but it's against 14 organizations, among them also Greenpeace. Um, simply for reporting again irregularities uh, in the um, committed by a giant uh, industrial co-farm owned by uh, this, uh, this diary company. Uh, they have the conciliation hearing um, in June. Um, the re representative of all 14 organizations decided, of course, uh, to not retract their, uh, the information they published. And the case is still pending, so I, I don't have like a real information about the case at the moment. Uh, but what I would like to um, to say, and I will um, leave to to Philip and Nadine to explain a little bit more about the, the context in Germany, is that the, these two cases are the peak of the tip of the iceberg. There are a lot of dark figures, um, and this is a way to um, uh, again saying that uh, for us the the most important challenge was and still is to find these cases, to make these cases visible, because there are a lot of uh, cases, a lot of victims, a lot of targets of SLAP. They really want to have a voice, but they don't have, at least in, in, in Spain, they don't have a platform. And we, with, with Batfox, we offer a platform. In our training, um, later we'll maybe discuss a little bit about the uh, what, what happened with our workshop in Spain, what, uh, I'm, I'm proud and happy to say that uh, uh, 40 lawyers uh, participate in our, in our training, but also uh, victims of SLAP. And it was interesting for me to say that, um, especially to um, what was interesting is not that they participated, that they assisted in the event, was the conversation that we have afterward, after the event, uh, in a session like the coffee break that uh, we had before, there is a way to really express the, uh, their feeling about the, also the kind of legal defense they are receiving uh, from a very inner circle of, of lawyers. So this is the, my, uh, what I can tell you, let's say, from, from Spain and leave it to you from uh, Germany. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And these were really perfect cues, I think, uh, lack of knowledge and um, tips of the iceberg, but also a highly motivated community and a, a community really searching for, for help and support. I think this all really uh, describes the situation in Germany quite well. Um, yeah, so we are running out of time. I'll just uh, keep, keep on with, with the German part um, as long as we have left, right? And uh, until we have our um, guests for the closing remark. Um, but yeah, so to wrap it up, maybe um, in, in Germany, the, the problem of SLAP is prevalent. It's it's a problem. It's it's uh, it's there. But still, it's a I'd say ambivalent uh, situation because um, media organizations, civil society actors who are affected by this, they know that that something is is um, is happening, and they know that that there is a, a threat um, which is becoming more and more threatening. Also. Um, so this is this is there. Um, at the other hand, the the public debate is not there yet. So it's not really a, 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 a yeah pub publicly aware problem. Just as you said, the lack of knowledge um, um, is, is also recognizable in, in Germany. Although they are really famous cases, um, they are not being debated as slap cases, um, but they make news. One of the biggest cases is um, the one of the so-called uh, House of Hohenzollern. I don't have the time to, to go into detail here, but you can look it up. It's, it has been really big and is considered by many as an example for such a, for such a slap case. Um, and also there is a lot of environmental activism and journalism affected by, by slaps. Um, so, for example, the uh, Environmental uh, Institute in, uh, from, from Munich, uh, Umweltinstitut München, um, they were really the ones also to start the German National Coalition um, with uh, actors from civil society and from media to, to work against this. Um, when, and then they, they started it when they got slapped by um, South Ty Tyrolean uh, farmers. And they made a campaign uh, regarding the use of pesticides on apples and got sued by uh, over 1,370 uh, farmers. And um, they, they, they played it quite, quite well. They, they, they also called it a slap. They made a big campaign. They took advantage of it, even in the aftermath of the, of the process. 
and when they just recently could publish uh, information that were that was un unveiled through the process. So I think that was really a good example how to how to fight back, how to get into the uh, offensive. But yeah, they're one of the of the rare examples where this um, can can happen like like that. We also had the example of um, uh, rainforest rescue. We we had Bettina here earlier today, so that's also a, a lucky example where it went out well. But um, yeah, so it's it's definitely um, a long way to go. And I think we are also at the end of our route for exactly. today. Exactly. Right? I think it's time for our closing remarks. Uh, I don't know if you want to introduce uh, our... Yes. Uh, with pleasure. Uh, closing remarks for today. With, with pleasure. So um, I hope you all had a, a, a great day today. And um, I'm really uh, pr um, uh, privileged and honored now to introduce um, two most distinguished speakers who will de deliver their closing remarks. Um, the President of the European Parliament, Madame Roberta Mazzola, and Mr. Juan Fernando Lopez Aguilar, who is chair of the European Parliament's Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs, and is also the host of today's event here. Thank you very much. And um, Madam President, Mr. Lopez Aguilar, it's a great pleasure to have you here. The floor is yours. Good day, everybody. And Please be most warmly welcome to the European Parliament, those of you who are visiting or attending this gathering, which is, of course, of the utmost importance for the European Parliament in all, and particularly for some of us who are deeply involved with this issue you've been discussing. And uh, let me just uh, address you a few words as we are waiting for Roberta Metzola, whom I think we're also expecting any time. But uh, it'll be my pleasure to, to share with you some thoughts on the issue that uh, has put us together this morning in the premises of the European Parliament in Brussels, which is precisely legal training on SLAP, strategic lawsuit, uh, uh, litigation against uh, public participation. That means that uh, it's, a, it's a tactique, which is part of a strategy, trying to refrain freedom of expression, free speech, free communication, freedom of the press, and free, uh, of course, free media, media pluralism, and investigative journalism in particular which is a pillar, which is a founding value of the European experience in all, and of course of EU law, the way we understand it. Media freedom and pluralism, I'm sure you know that it's most appreciated as an asset of the European experience. It's clearly told in the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 10, the European Charter for Fundamental Rights, Article 11, and uh, Sure, you're aware that the European Charter of Fundamental Rights is the Bill of Rights, is the EU Bill of Rights, which comes along with the Lisbon Treaty, which is our constitution, which is the primary law, which means that, in a way, it's the supreme law of the land at the European scale, and with the same validity of the Treaty of Lisbon itself, which is clearly said and stated in Article 6 of the Treaty of the European Union. And despite this relevant focus that we have put on the legal value of EU legislation regarding free speech and media pluralism, as human rights defenders know only too well, these values, this asset of the European experience and EU law have been under threat have been in dire straits at times, and uh, we should be worried about it. We should, we should care, because this worrisome trend is uh, also shown in the 
series of reports that we had for the for the past years. We we set in motion. I'm sure you know a so-called rule of law, fundamental rights, and democracy mechanism, a framework, a standing framework, which has resulted in a series of reports that have been conveyed before the European Parliament by the EU Commission, by Commissioner Commissioner. Uh, Reinders, Commissioner for Justice, we're welcoming Roberta Metzola, President of the European Parliament. You're welcome to the podium. Let me shake your hand. <laughs> but I was addressing the audience with some thoughts before you have the final say this morning. And as we said... at your food on the way in. Yes, there, there's some food. There's, we, 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 uh, we need some of it because I am... Yes. Uh, I am I am linking this this uh, this remarks precisely with the coordinators meeting of the of the Libre Committee. I'm sure you know how it's like. It's going to be two hours of hard work right afterwards. So the point I was making is that yes, we've had a series of reports by Commissioner Reinders, the EU Commission, related to the fundamental rights, democracy, and uh, rule of law situation in every member state because it's an assessment, an overall assessment, but it follows with the country report of all the 27. And yes, we have noticed physical and online threats, attacks on journalists on the rise in several member states, particularly in some, for sure. And it means that the EU simply is not yet free of attacks even severe attacks to media freedom and pluralism. That is why, of course, we, we have discussed every time we have seen journalists murdered in a member state of the European Union. Of course, we all have in mind, the, because it's emblematic, the name of Daphne Caruana Galicia, which was thoroughly discussed throughout the years, and uh, actually the, the press room in this European Parliament were, bears the name of, no, in, 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 the, in the premises of Strasbourg, bears the name of Daphne Caruana, but she doesn't happen, sadly, to be the only one journalist murdered in the past few years in, in the European Union. There have been cases in the Czech Republic, there have been cases in Slovakia, there have been cases in Bulgaria, there have been cases in the Netherlands, So I'm insisting, I'm highlighting this member state, which is a funding member state of the European Union, because this is no ground for usual suspects. I'm being ironic. This is no ground for usual suspects. No one is free from this kind of serious attacks to media freedom and media pluralism. The Netherlands and yes, Greece and yes, Greece, um, an assassination which is not yet cleared. So the European Parliament has been insistingly calling on the Commission to come with new policies, legislation, procedures, mechanisms to safeguard media pluralism and protect journalists against abusive lawsuits aiming to silence media pluralism and media freedom, to silence journalists. We adopted the resolution May 20. 18 on media pluralism and media freedom, inviting the Commission to come up with anti slap directive, protecting independent media from lawsuits aiming to silencing or intimidating journalists, an invitation that has been reiterated throughout the years. Latest is November 2021. 20, we adopted a resolution on slap calling on the Commission to come with a package, both soft and hard law, including early dismissal mechanism addressing the number of, increasing number of slap against journalists, NGOs, academic and civil society. In that resolution, we suggested that the Commission should include general rules providing protection against slap, proper functioning of the internal market, as well as rules both on criminal and civil justice. 
And the Parliament welcomes, hangs, sure, the Commission's proposal for a directive protecting persons who engage in public participation from manifestly unfounded or abusive court proceedings, strategic lawsuits against public participation that was finally put in place 2022, last year, and uh, which includes early dismissal of slap cases, sanctions against claimants, and remedies for defendants. But we still lack legislation covering criminal cases that is focusing on the criminal field, which is also a competence of this European Parliament as a criminal lawmaker. That is why Parliament keeps the calling on the Commission to take over all proposals from our resolution adopted in 2021, namely amending Brussels 1 and Rome 2 regulations, libel tourism for shopping, address criminal cases, and address ongoing cases to mention the most important ones. So the Parliament welcomes the Commission recommendation. No legislative action, including training for judges and legal practitioners, meaning you, legal training, providing financial support for the victims, support for independent bodies dealing with complaints from those victims, a public register, relevant court decisions and support have victims of SLAP, giving access to EU guidance. So that proposal for a directive has been deferred to two committees of this House, including the one I chair, the Libya Committee, and also the Yuri Committee, and we're working full speed to make it happen. So I can only welcome you all to this House of the European Parliament, which represents you all, fellow lawyers, colleagues, legal professionals, and we call of course, very expressly, of all of you, we call on all of you to be the messengers to help us to fight against and to raise awareness on every case of unlawful uh, and uh, intimidation or uh, restriction of media freedom and pluralism. The legal profession has a very special responsibility in this in this uh, realm by not assisting on unlawful cases, helping the efforts of EU institutions to protect EU values. So within the organizers of this very good gathering, it was a very good idea in the first place, and we promise that we will deliver. We will do our best to bring about some change for the better when protecting media freedom and media pluralism. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Juan Fernando. Let me, before you leave to your coordinators' meetings, the fun, the most fun meetings that we have in this house, which I spent many years uh, um, uh, having the privilege of being a member of, uh, I'd like to echo what you just said uh, and the commitment of this parliament uh, uh, to this cause. And I call it a cause because I will perhaps take you through, Elizabeth, of a, from a historical point of view of how we, we got here. Uh, and it is by no mean feat that we are today organizing a meeting uh, um, as legal professionals and as lawyers. I'm very proud to be one uh, myself on an issue that the parliament has been speaking about for years. Uh, I have been a member of this parliament since 2013, so 10 years now. Uh, and I can tell you that already uh, since 2014, 2015, this parliament started to say that there are some gaps uh, in the implementation of the civil law instruments, but also in the fact that our fourth pillar of democracy is not being covered. We talk about everything, but we talk, don't talk about uh, the freedom of journalists to investigate stories, to make sure that politicians are not above the law, and to hold everybody to account. Many years passed um, uh, before anything much was done. But I must say that the assassination of, of Daphne Caruana Galizia triggered us into action, into realizing that we have in our European Union, and a few months later, first in Malta, then in Slovakia, uh, people who are assassinated simply for investigating uh, the truth. Uh, 
no matter how difficult the stories are, no matter how uncomfortable that truth is, there is absolutely no way in this world, and especially in the European Union, that those people should be assassinated for doing what they have to do and what they have to be protected in doing. And I say this because it is, it, for many years, as we, again, uh, we used to talk about strategic lawsuits against public participation, huge differences between member states, hugely legal frameworks, some member states saying we already have protection uh, against such uh, um, uh, cross-border activity, let's call it that, uh, but some member states flatly refusing to even go there. Uh, and this is where the European Parliament decided um, two and a half years ago to put forward its own proposal on anti-SLAPP. Uh, I was a rapporteur there for the Civil Liberties Committee, which one Ferrando shares, chairs, uh, and the um, Timo Volken uh, was my uh, colleague from the Legal Affairs Committee, uh, in order to to push the Commission into action. And we have recognized this as a very effective tool uh, in identifying previously, let's say, uncovered legislative territory. Lots of discussion. You might remember the first debates we had in the joint committee meetings about the legal basis, the extent of the legal basis, the restriction to cross-border, the identification of funds, the different protection regimes for, for journalists in different countries, uh, as the, let's say, the obstacles that were being put forward. But we pushed through on the basis and the premise that slaps are not legitimate lawsuits. They are aimed at intimidating, they are aimed at making sure that journalists are financially and emotionally drained. And therefore, they find themselves in no other, with no other option than to self-censor, self -censor, which produces uh, a chilling effect on the reporting of abuses. So essentially, their one and only goal was to silence. And we had to ask ourselves, how can it be that we do not have uh, a legal basis in our huge infrastructure in order to create a protection there? Uh, and we spoke a lot to national institutes of journalists, but we also spoke to individual journalists who told us that sometimes they are left alone. Sometimes editorially, they are left alone. Sometimes, and this, this is a specific case in, in, in some countries, when a journalist leaves a publishing house to go to another publishing house, the libel suit follows them. And therefore, it is sometimes in the interest of the house for the journalist to move. And these were all situations that we wanted to cover with our report. And we are very happy um, to see that all the work, uh, and I see a lot of familiar faces here, uh, of activists that for so long said that our legal remedies and our defamation laws should not be abused in order to serve the purpose of who wants to silence. Uh, and uh, when uh, we saw the, the Commission's proposal, we immediately said this serves as a good basis, we will work with it. Uh, I would say we take credit on the fact that there is a proposal on the table because the Parliament had its uh, own uh, initiative report. But there was also a situation where ministers in different governments were being put under pressure to push through. And that's thanks to your work, that we had ministers in the Council saying, actually, this is a, a demand from my own national parliament, from my own national civil society activists. And the increased number of cases that we have seen Remains to be seen, and I see Justin uh, on, on, on call, I don't know whether he's still connected, but with specific reference to the United Kingdom, uh, and what will happen now in this situation where a vast majority of suits are instituted or brought before courts of the United Kingdom, uh, and how will that, even in the context of the Brussels II and Rome II application to cross-border enforcement of judicial decisions? That, will, that is still, I would say, very uh, uncharted territory in a post-Brexit agreement scenario yesterday. 
but we have already started to face it from the security perspective, um, uh, exchange of information perspective, and my, let's say here, I don't represent the European Parliament in saying this, but as a lawyer, I would say that this should be also something we build on in uh, our relations with the United Kingdom with recognition of judicial decisions and, 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 and cases. Still very far away from that. Um, so I'll, I'll conclude by saying that the Parliament is your ally, uh, very much welcome uh, to the to the Pat Fox's consortium for what you are doing. Uh, thank you for organising events in this Parliament. Hold members of the European Parliament to account. Push them to go faster on the Media Freedom Act uh, in in Libe. Uh, and the new re <laughs> you cannot say it's you, yes. not you, but yes, you can say that. <laughs> but a lot to do, one. But. Uh, we have a huge amount of legislative work to do before um, uh, the end of May 2024. And I would be, let's say, extremely proud of the fact that this mandate can be looked at as the one where we made a huge leap on media freedom and protection of uh, truth uh, um, discoverers and finders in our house and in our union. Thanks a lot.